We're live on Capitol Hill. The House is not in session, but Democrats on the Energy and Commerce Committee holding a meeting looking at a traumatic brain injury. They'll hear from medical officials, a couple of former uh, NFL players and others in a discussion that's uh, set to last a couple of hours. We'll have live coverage here on C-SPAN. It's about to get underway. Frank Pallone, the ranking member on the Energy and Commerce Committee, is leading the meeting. Um, Thank you all uh, for being here today. I want to thank all of our participants um, at this Joint Energy and Commerce and Judiciary Committee uh, Democratic Forum. And of course, I want to particularly thank our uh, Judiciary Committee ranking member. I call him Chairman Conyers because he was uh, the chairman when we were in the majority. I've never been uh, in this position in the majority, so I I can refer to you as chairman, but not myself. So thank you, uh, Chairman Conyers, for joining us to examine the long-term impacts of repetitive brain trauma, in particular trauma associated with contact sports. And I look forward to engaging in a dialogue with our witnesses about this very important issue. Every week at this time of year, football players at all levels take the field and engage in a contact sport that they enjoy playing, but that may be harmful to their health in the future. There are a lot of concerning questions that we will discuss today. At the very least, athletes and their families need to know that they are being informed about the health risks and that the risks associated with contact sports are being mitigated to the greatest extent possible. With more and more research coming out, the evidence is becoming clearer and clearer. The effects of repeated head trauma, even those received during one's youth, can accumulate and cause serious and devastating conditions. And these conditions can stem from injuries once considered minor, known as subconcusive, I'm sorry, sub, subconcusive hits or repetitive hits to the head. Boston University researchers, led by our witnesses today, uh, Dr. Ann McGee, Dr. Bob Stern, and Dr. Chris Nowinski, have found that exposure to hits, regardless of whether a concussion occurred, is associated with a markedly increased risk of mood disorders like depression. And these researchers have also repeatedly found evidence of a linkage between head impacts and CTE, a devastating degenerative brain disease. Most notably, in a major study released this summer, these researchers examined the brains of 111 deceased National Football League players whose families chose to donate their brains to the Boston University program. And the study showed that 110 of the deceased players suffered from CTE during their lifetimes. I'm pleased that we're joined by all three of these researchers who are conducting critically important research. Their research must be considered by athletic associations and others, including Congress, as we look for real solutions to this devastating disease. And I thank them for their invaluable contribution to this area and look forward to hearing more today. Beyond this research, there are a number of unanswered questions about what risk factors make individuals more susceptible to these debilitating conditions. We need to understand what happens to the brain when it's hit and how many hits trigger these neurological effects. We also need to investigate whether it's possible to diagnose CTE during life and what treatments should be offered to those struggling with cognitive issues due to cumulative brain trauma. And while there's still research that needs to be done, that should not be an excuse for inaction. What is not in dispute is the association between head trauma from contact sports such as football and lasting brain damage and degenerative diseases like CTE. A number of our panelists today have played professional football or have family members who did. And I want to welcome former NFL players Harry Carson, who I've met before, uh, DeAndre Levy, and Mike Adam Lee. We're also joined by Mr. Adam Lee's wife, Kim, Kim Adam Lee, and Dr. Eleanor Perfetto, uh, who was a widow of the late NFL player Ralph Wenzel. Uh, they have witnessed firsthand the long-term exposure or the long-term effects of exposure to repetitive head impacts. They can speak to the challenges they live with and have witnessed as a result of this trauma. And they can also speak to the concerns for the future and whether they believe they will be adequately supported by the NFL or other organizations as they face future challenges. And I'd also like to mention that we invited the NFL to attend, but they declined. 
The science has raised enough red flags about the dangers of repetitive head trauma that I think it's incumbent upon those who organize and promote contact sports to take every effort to make the games as safe as possible. That commitment must come from all levels of play, including from the highest level of football. Since the NFL recognizes the link between repetitive hits and brain trauma, they need to commit to supporting independent research, meaningful, meaningfully reducing the risk, and supporting players suffering from the effects of long-term brain injury. So this forum is critically important. It's unfortunate, however, that this discussion is not being conducted in a formal congressional hearing. Despite our repeated requests for a series of hearings on this subject last year, the Republican majority agreed to one hearing during the last Congress on concussions in youth sports, and that's simply not enough. But I'm hopeful that today's forum will, build, will help us build momentum for further action and discussion. I thank you again to all our witnesses for your contributions or for being here for this important discussion on traumatic brain injuries in athletics. And I hope we can all continue to work together to find the best ways to address this significant uh, public health issue. Um, I, I'm not going to mention the, 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 my colleagues by name because they're uh, each going to be part of this uh, forum and discussion. But I do want to say that looking at the, the people that are up here, uh, my colleagues that are up here, really many of them have played a major role uh, in dealing with issues. So I appreciate the fact that they're here today. So let me uh, call on a rank, uh, I call him chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Congressman Conyers, for an opening statement. Thank you for letting us use your room as well. Oh, <laughs> you get the bill. <laughs> Top of the morning, everybody. What a pleasure it is uh, to be here uh, with uh, our energy and commerce uh, ranking member, Frank Pallone, and all my colleagues in sponsoring this event. It's an important event, and it's taken a little while to get there, and we've got a long way to go. Today's forum brings together some of the nation's leading experts from the medical research and athletic communities to review the causes, effects, and treatments of concussions and other head trauma. In particular, the forum examines what is known about brain injuries, what gaps exist in scientific literature, and what is being done to address those gaps. The following year, the Judiciary Committee uh, it will also feature first-hand accounts from individuals who suffered from subconcussive trauma or have witnessed its long-term effects on their loved ones. And that's why we have Eight people, two, four, six. We have a, this is a, a very unusual forum, and I'm, I'm glad of it. When I was chairman of Judiciary Committee, we held a hearing in 2009 on football head injuries, which was prompted by the mounting scientific evidence connecting head injuries in football and cognitive problems later on in life. During that hearing, the National Football League refused to acknowledge a connection between head injuries on the football field and the subsequent development of brain diseases. The following year, the Judiciary Committee held a hearing in Detroit, Michigan followed by forums in Houston and New York City as part of our ongoing commitment to calling attention to this problem and examining ways to prevent head injuries in youth, high school, and in college football as well. And this brings us to today's forum, where our medical panelists will discuss their recently published studies examining the brains of 111 deceased National Football League players, which found that an astounding 
110 of them had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE for short. Although scientific evidence clearly links head injuries in football to cognitive problems later in life, between 1.6 million and 3.8 million sports and rec related uh, sports and recreational related concussions occur each year, according to the Center for Disease Control. The extent of injury is particularly problematic for our youth as most brains are not fully developed until 25 years of age. As a result, a concussion is more dangerous for youth than it is for an adult. And so I hope the panelists today will provide guidance on how we can better protect all athletes, especially our young athletes. And I would be remiss if I did not briefly comment concerning the President of the United States' recent series of statements concerning our nation's professional football players. At his rally in Alabama on September 22nd, he mocked the National Football League's efforts to prevent brain injuries, declaring Two guys, just really beautiful tackle. Boom. 15 yards. The referee goes on television. His wife's so proud of him. They're ruining the game. They're ruining the game. End of quotation. The President of the United States then went on to use the power of his and the Vice President's bully pulpits and Twitter feeds to rail against the right of private citizens to express their views and right to protest as guaranteed by, of course, the First Amendment's free speech protection. Ironically, uh, President Trump has not uttered a single word about the actual underlying issue the glaring disparities in how African Americans are dealt with under our criminal justice system and their treatment by law enforcement officers, which have often had deadly consequences. These are problems, by the way, which have gotten worse, not better, uh, in my view, under the Trump administration and Sessions Justice Department of Justice Department. Now, Today's forum will allow us to return to the actual facts and evidence and consider how we can best protect football players at all levels in an incredibly violent sport. And so I thank all the panelists and the members for being here today. And I turn it back to Mr. Pallone, my colleague and friend. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you so much for your comments and again for uh, having, letting us uh, have a place to have this uh, forum today. Um, I wanted to introduce the panelists, but you know, I, normally um, members of Congress get to make opening statements when they come to these uh, forums, and we're not doing that today because they've all agreed not to in order so we could get to the panelists. But let me just at least uh, introduce everybody up here if I could. Um, uh, first on my left is Jan Schakowsky. She's a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. She's from Chicago. But she's probably done more on this issue than any other member. Um, I have to be honest. She's just been out uh, very concerned about this whole issue of concussion in sports and been out front on it from the beginning. Uh, to her left is um, Jerry McNearney from California, also a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. 
And then to my right is Steve Cohen, who's from uh, Memphis, uh, outspoken on so many issues. Mis I'll call you the investigative uh, congressman, because you're always investigating everything very effectively. And then we have David Ciceline. Both of them are members of the Judiciary Committee. And David is the co-chair of our, uh, of our uh, message, or uh, what do we call it, Democratic Policy Group. Um, and he plays a major role um, in getting our message and developing our policy. So on our panel, we have today uh, Dr. Ann uh, McGee, I guess I'm going from my left, Dr. Ann McGee, who's director of the CTE Center at Boston University. We have Dr. Robert Stern, who's director of clinical research for the Boston University CTE Center. Then we have Dr. Chris Nowinski, who's co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation and co-founder of the Boston University CTE Center. Then we have Harry Carson, who is uh, uh, a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and linebacker for the Super Bowl 21 winning New York Giants, who served as team captain of the Giants for 10 seasons. I guess you probably figured he's my favorite, so whatever. <laughs> um, and then after that is, uh, is uh, DeAndre Levy, who was a starting linebacker for the Tr Detroit Lions from 2009 through 2015. Um, and then uh, we have Mike Adam Lee, who was a record-setting fullback for Northwestern and played for the Chiefs, the Jets, and the Bears before entering into a 40-plus uh, career in broadcasting, during which he worked for all of the major networks. And then we have his wife, uh, Kim, Adam Lee, uh, who has supported um, Mike throughout his struggles with dementia, and she's an educational consultant and school psychology teacher with three decades of experience conducting cognitive assessments. And then last is Dr. Eleanor Perfetto, who's Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives uh, for the National Health Council, and she was the caregiver for her spouse, Ralph Wenzel, prior to his death due to CTE. So thank you all. So you're all such experts and personal knowledge of uh, what we're dealing with today. Uh, I was going to start, uh, I, I would like to have two people um, uh, start, and that's uh, Dr. Ann McGee first, um, if you would uh, make a statement. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Pallone, Ranking Member Conyers, and distinguished members of the committees. This is a, a great honor and a great pleasure to be here. And I'm going to try to summarize the work that we've done on CTE, as well as discuss uh, two of our recent papers. And then Dr. Stern uh, will discuss his uh, research and his recent paper. Uh, so the first question is, what is CTE? CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a progressive neurodegenerative disease found in athletes and military veterans with a history of repetitive head trauma, including concussions and asymptomatic con subconcussive hits to the head. CTE is increasingly recognized as a potential risk for athletes participating in contact sports, such as American football, but also soccer, boxing, and ice hockey. Military veterans who are exposed to explosive blasts are also at risk for CTE. CTE is characterized by the buildup of an abnormal protein called tau in nerve cells and nerve cell processes in a unique pattern in the brain. CTE gradually interferes with normal brain functioning and may lead to changes in behavior such as impulsivity, explosivity and violence, changes in mood such as depression and hopelessness, and cognitive changes such as memory loss and cognitive decline. At the current time, CTE can only be diagnosed after death by examination of the brain, and there are no known treatments for the disorder. Also unknown at this time is the exact prevalence of CTE in amateur and professional and contact sport athletes, as well as military veterans. Given that millions of contact sport athletes and military service members are exposed to repetitive head trauma every year, CTE has become a major health, public health concern. Over the last nine years, there have been many advances in our understanding of CTE. My colleagues at VA Boston Healthcare System, Boston University, and the Concussion Legacy Foundation <laughs> developed the largest brain bank in the world in, in 2008 
to study the long-term effects of exposure to repetitive head trauma and CTE. The VABU-CLF Brain Bank now contains the brains and spinal cords of over 450 athletes, military veterans, and civilians who experience repetitive head trauma. We've diagnosed CTE in over 280 individuals and published the clinical and pathological features of over 70% of the confirmed cases reported worldwide uh, since CTE was first identified in 1928 by Harrison Martland and first named chronic traumatic encephalopathy by McDonald Critchley in 1949. We reported the first case of CT in high school football, college football, soccer, boxing, baseball, ice hockey, mixed martial arts, the youngest athlete to be diagnosed with CTE, and the first case series of CTE in military veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. We've published original articles on the relationship between CTE and the development of motor neuron disease, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. We've analyzed the roles of other proteins uh, in CTE, including beta amyloid, alpha-synuclein, TDP43, and we've begun to investigate how the abnormal tau protein in CTE spreads from one nerve cell to another to result in widespread disease. In 2013, we defined the pathological features for the diagnosis of CTE and developed a staging scheme to assess pathological severity. We now know there is a unique pathological hallmark of CTE. There is a hallmark tau lesion that does not exist in a normal brain or in any other neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease. This hallmark CTE lesion allows for the precise pathological diagnosis of CTE. This unique lesion of CTE is present in small areas of the brain in the beginning of the disease, and it becomes widespread and distributed throughout the brain in advanced disease. Uh, two consensus panels of expert neuropathologists sponsored by the National Institute of Neurologic Disease and Stroke and the National Institute of Biomedical and Imaging and Bioengineering have defined this lesion as a pathognomonic lesion or a specific and diagnostic lesion for CTE. Research by biomedical engineers has also suggested that the reason tau is de deposited in this unique pattern in CTE is that these are the brain regions that are subjected to the greatest stress and physical strain during head, head impact trauma. Data from our studies also indicate that the severity of CTE pathology increases with the length of a football player career or the number of years between starting to play and retirement from the sport. Recently, we reported the largest and most methodologically rigorous case series of individuals with CTE ever published in the journal JAMA. The clinical and neuropathological methods used in this study were superior to all previously published case series on CTE. A panel of four neuropathologists used the defined NINDS criteria to make the diagnosis of CTE without any knowledge of the clinical history, and the clinical case description was standardized, comprehensive, and performed blinded to the pathology and reviewed by a panel of clinicians. Not only did this JAMA study more than double the size of any previous case series, all the participants were exposed to a relatively similar type of head trauma experienced during the play of football. The case series included 202 American football players um, at all levels of play. Um, excuse me, missing something. At all levels of play and um, whose brains were donated for research. The study found that 177, or 87% of the brain donors were diagnosed with CTE using the strictly defined criteria. This included three of, of 14 high school players, high school only players, three of 14, 21%, 48 of 53 college football players, or 91%, uh, and 110 of 111 NFL players, or 99%. The study also found that nearly all former NFL players had severe CTE, and in players with either mild or severe CTE, behavioral, mood, and cognitive problems were frequent. Dementia was common among those players with severe CTE. So what is the prevalence of CTE in the general population? 
The JAMA study was not a population study and cannot be used to determine how common CTE is in the general population. It was also not representative of all living football players, as most of the subjects in the study played football for long periods of time at high levels. However, the JAMA study does tell us, beyond any reasonable doubt, that, football, that people who play football for many years develop CTE much more often than people who do not. Now, what does the JAMA study indicate about the prevalence of CTE? Uh, the critical question con is the denominator for the study. The denominator is not the approximately 20 million former football players in the general population or 177 out of 20 million. The denominator for the JAMA study is the number of individuals who played football and died during the same study period. We don't know that number for former high school and college players, but Alan Schwartz, formerly of the New York Times, has provided the number of former NFL players who died during the study period, and he, that number is 1,300. So even if, uh, if one makes the highly improbable assumption that all of the former NFL players whose brains were donated to our brain bank during the study period were neg whose brains were not donated to our brain bank, were negative for CTE, the minimum prevalence among former NFL players would be 10%. 10% is the minimum percentage it could possibly be, and it would be reasonable to assume that the actual percentage is much higher. The question then becomes, if a minimum of 10% of football play NFL players develop a devastating and progressive, un treatable disease as a result of playing football at the professional level, is that an acceptable risk? I think the answer to that is no. There is also the issue of selection bias in the JAMA study. In this study, as in all of our peer-reviewed published original articles, we were careful to acknowledge there is selection bias. That is, most of the football players' brains were donated by families who suspected that their loved ones had symptoms of CTE. It is important to emphasize that the brain bank team never asked the family about clinical symptoms before donation. The only question that is asked is whether or not the loved one was exposed to head trauma. However, we recognize that if a family suspects something is wrong with a loved one, or if a loved one died from suicide or accidental death, the family is much more likely to uh, pursue brain donation. Yet, remember, brain donor families are not skilled diagnosticians or medical professionals. The donor families have no laboratory tests or sophisticated methods to make a diagnosis of CTE. So despite their humble limitations, the donor families had a diagnostic accuracy rate of 87% for CTE in the JAMA study. 87% is a diagnostic accuracy rate that would be impressive, even for a tertiary, tertiary medical center focused on neurodegenerative disease with all the state-of-the-art medical advances at their disposal. Furthermore, selection bias is a factor for donors to all sorts of brain banks, including our other brain banks, like the BU Alzheimer Brain Bank and the Framingham Study Brain Bank. And yet fewer of, than 5% of those brain donors have been diagnosed with CTE. So these critical caveats and the fact that we've been able to amass 177 instances of CTE in football players over a brief eight-year period is an indication that CTE is not rare CTE may be under-recognized, but it is certainly not rare. In addition, we found CTE, even very severe CTE, in individuals who only played football at the college level, and that's a cause for us all to be concerned. Our work on the neuropathological uh, examination of brain donors has also led to advances in understanding the, and the diagnosis of CTE, advances that are beginning to lead to the identification of what we call novel biomarkers to detect CTE in living people, and we hope uh, will also lead to new treatments for people suffering from CTE. The unique perivascular tau lesion, that pathognomonic CTE E lesion is associated with a robust and persistent inflammation. Our studies show that there is a significant increase in brain inflammation after exposure to football, and this inflammation increases further as CTE develops and becomes progressively more severe. 
In September uh, 2017, my colleagues and I reported in the journal PLOS One that the inflammatory cytokine CCL11 was elevated in the brain tissue of former college and professional football players compared to non-athletes with Alzheimer's disease and non-athlete controls. We also took post-mortem samples of cerebral spinal fluid from individuals with CTE uh, controls and Alzheimer's disease and found that the levels of CCL11 in the CSF were similar, were normal in the controls in Alzheimer's disease, but elevated in CTE, again suggesting that CCL11 might, in the CSF might be able to assist in the detection of CTE during life. These findings represent the early steps towards identifying CTE in living people and offer mechanistic insights into possible future treatments for CTE. Additional studies are needed and are being undertaken to validate this study, determine whether CCL11 can be detected in the spinal fluid or blood of living individuals at risk for CTE, and whether CCL11 levels can predict the severity of disease in living individuals. CTE is a risk for football players, especially football players who play a long time and at a high level. CTE is a risk for all contact sport athletes, military veterans, and any individual who experiences repetitive head trauma, including concussions and subconcussions. We have made major advances at our understanding of CTE over the past nine years, but to f further accelerate critical knowledge in the prevalence of CTE, the prevention of CTE, the risk of exposure exposure, the genetics of CTE, the diagnosis of CTE, and effective treatment for CTE, we will need additional research funding. CTE needs to be recognized as an Alzheimer-related neurodegeneration and as part of the National Research Action Plan. If we understand what goes wrong in the brain in CTE and leads to the buildup of the abnormal tau protein and speeds the deposition of other neurodegenerative proteins after head trauma, we will make enormous progress in the fight against all neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease and many other neurodegeneration. If we are truly concerned about the brain and mental health of future generations of Americans, including military service personnel, we will commit to additional research for funding for CTE. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKee. Uh, let me also mention that we've been joined by uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee from Texas. Thank you for being with us. Now, just so you know, what we're going to do is we're going to hear next from Dr. Bob Stern. The rest of the panelists are, are, have agreed to not make opening statements, so we can go right to questions. And so that's what we'll do after, uh, after Dr. Stern. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Ranking Member Pallone. Ranking Member Conyers and distinguished members of the committees, uh, it is indeed a great honor to participate in this forum today. Since 2008, my research has focused on the long-term consequences of repetitive brain trauma in athletes, including this neurodegenerative disease, CTE. As you've heard from Dr. McKee, at this time, CTE can only be diagnosed after death through post-mortem neuropathological examination. Several important questions about CTE remain unanswered, such as how common is it? Why does one person get it and another person does not? And how can we differentiate CTE from other similar diseases and conditions with similar symptoms? And to answer all these and other really important questions, the ability to diagnose CTE during life is the critical next step. Our group at Boston University and other scientists from around the country are actively conducting research to develop methods to accurately diagnose CTE during life. I'm honored to be the lead investigator of a $16 million seven-year longitudinal multi-center investigation funded by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. That study brings together a network of approximately 50 investigators from around the country from 10 major research institutions. The study, referred to as the Diagnose CTE Research Project, is aimed at developing methods of diagnosing CTE during life. And we're studying several hundred former professional football players, former college football players, and men uh, of the same age who never had any exposure to these repetitive hits or other brain trauma. 
All of these folks undergo extensive testing over a three-day period at one of our four sites around the country and then return three years later for a follow-up evaluation. We are developing, refining, and testing a variety of potential biological tests for CTE, including new experimental PET scans that allow us to actually see the buildup of that abnormal tau protein in the brain during life, as well as advanced MRI scans, spinal fluid measures, and new blood tests that may be able to detect the disease even before the symptoms begin. I'm confident that we will have an accurate method or methods to detect and diagnose CTE during life within the next five years. However, we cannot wait for the availability of these tests to begin to examine who may be at greatest risk for this devastating disease. Previous research shows that the brain undergoes key periods of development and maturation during childhood. And several brain structures and functions of the brain reached their peak development during the period leading up to age 12 in boys. Therefore, our group has conducted a series of research studies to examine if there may be a period of vulnerability during which exposure to repeated subconcussive trauma through the routine play of tackle football may result in later life neurological abnormalities. Three of these peer-reviewed studies involved former NFL players between the ages of 40 and 69. We found that the former players who began playing tackle football prior to age 12 had significantly worse memory and other cognitive functioning, as well as abnormal MRI findings compared to those who started to play at age 12 or older. And the total number of years they played did not account for these findings. Rather, the earlier they started playing in childhood, the worse the problems in adulthood. But we also wanted to know if this age at first exposure to football was also important in the millions of people who only play football up through high school or up through college and didn't go on to play in the pros. In a recently published study, we found that participation in tackle football before age 12 increased the odds for later life clinically elevated depression scores by threefold and increased the odds for having problems with behavioral regulation by twofold. And these findings were independent of the total number of years the participants played football through their life or at what level they played through, such as high school or college or the pros. In addition to the age of first exposure to tackle football, we've examined the relationship between the estimated total number of head impacts someone sustains playing football and later life problems. In a study published earlier this year, we found a strong dose-response relationship between the estimated total number of head impacts experienced through youth, high school, and college football and the risk for developing cognitive, mood, and behavioral impairments later in life. In layman's terms, the more hits to the head a football player received, the more likely they were to have impaired thinking skills, as well as depression and behavioral regulation difficulties decades later. Now, it's really important to note that participation in sports and athletics during childhood can have many important benefits including the development of teamwork, self-confidence, and social skills, not to mention the tremendous health benefits from exercise. Therefore, the goal should be to make sure that children can take advantage of all the benefits of sports participation without the risk of brain-related difficulties later in life. That's a difficult balance and requires a combination of unbiased scientific information and just plain common sense. In closing, I want to thank you for your interest in addressing this important issue and for your continued commitment toward protecting the health and safety of all athletes. I also want to express my gratitude toward Congress in general for continued support of NIH funding, but also to underscore the need for expanded funding for brain research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stern.
Let me explain that the rest of the uh, panel are going to be answering questions and shouldn't hesitate um, if the question isn't uh, directed to you and you want to answer it, please you know, indicate that you'd like to. Um, and in terms of our questions, it's going to be the, the two of us as the co-chairs or whatever, and then we're going to go based on seniority with the rest of you, okay? What'd you say? Civility? No, I said seniority, not civility. <laughs> Although you are, are those civilities important, as you often mention to me? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, Steve. All right. So let me start out. In recent years, we have seen sports teams and leagues recognizing the potential dangers of concussions by attempting to develop rules and protocol to make sports safer for participants. Such approaches include additional medical evaluations if a hard hit to the head occurs or prohibiting certain types of activities such as head-to-head -head tackles. But this focus on concussions seems to obscure the more important issue. That is, there's a growing body of research that continuous or sustained sub-concussive hits may contribute more to long-term brain injury than periodic concussions. And I think both Dr. McGee and, and Dr. Stern have, uh, have indicated that. So let me start out with them. Dr. McGee, can you tell us what the evidence shows about the effect of sub-concussive hits on the brain? Have sub-concussive hits, even in the absence of a concussion diagnosis, been linked to decreased cognitive functioning or changes in brain chemistry? So what we know from our postmortem studies is that 20% uh, of the individuals who played football uh, develop C and develop CTE never had a reported concussion. What we found over and over, it's the length of their playing career or their exposure to football and the many hits that occur on every play of the game. Uh, it's this dose response to the years of playing football that increased the risk for CTE. Others have shown this too. They've looked at high school athletes playing football, uh, soccer, as well as ice hockey, and they find that even in the absence of a concussion, those individuals, uh, if you look at those individuals at the beginning of the playing season and then look at them again at the end of the playing season, there will be changes in their white matter on uh, sophisticated neuroimaging, there will be changes in their cognitive function, and this provides evidence that it's the low-level hits, uh, the routine hits, especially that occur in football, nearly on every play of the game, that lead to long-term uh, changes and also are, increase the risk for CTE. Well, thank you. Now, let me ask you and Dr. Stern, I understand that professional football players can get more than 1,000 sub-concussive hits in a single season of play. According to some estimates, players get hit hundreds of times per season, even, even at the youth and high school level. So even if a football player is never diagnosed with a concussion, why should we be concerned about this volume of sub-concussive hits? Either one of you, Dr. Stern. Let's, let's make it even, bring it down to the youth level. Um, there was a, a study published a little less than a year ago, not from our group, um, that looked at kids, youth football players, between the ages of around 8 and 13, and they put accelerometer gizmos inside their helmets to measure the number and, and severity of the hits that they got. But all those kids also had MRI scans done before the season and after the season. And they took out any kid who had a diagnosed concussion, so it was only looking at the routine play without anyone who had a concussion. And what they found was that the total exposure to hits, the routine exposure to hits, the subconcussive trauma, was directly associated with changes to the white matter of the brain in just one season of play. That's the little kids. There's been multiple other studies looking at high school students, college students, after just one season of play, alterations in the structures of the brain, in the functioning of the brain, in the cognitive functioning. That's just the immediate short-term complications. But as Dr. McKee has pointed out, later on in life, we see both in living players and also in the deceased players that Dr. McKee examines that there's this relationship between the total exposure to playing football and when we try to estimate the total number of hits between those number of hits they've received throughout their life and even changes in blood tests of tau, and changes in the MRI, and especially problems with thinking and memory. Now, what about the connection between these subconcussive hits and CTE? 
Either of you want to answer that? Uh, well, again, it's the same. It's really what we're finding is a dose response, uh, best measured uh, as number of playing years. That the longer you play football, the higher your risk for CTE, and the higher the severity of the CTE. We're still we're working on this risk profile. That's something that we think is uh, immediately you know, very important uh, in terms of developing some guidelines for length of play that might be safe and when you are heading into a more high risk category. But we're not there yet. Now, I don't know if you can answer this, but uh, the concern, of course, is you know subconcussive versus concussions. In other words. Uh, how do they compare in terms of the risks in a, in a sport like football? Or can you can you answer that? Uh, it's really important to understand that there there isn't a very clear diagnosis of what a concussion is. It's a clinical diagnosis at this point. There's no test that specifically says this person's had a diag uh, has had a concussion, and so there's this continuum of what's going on in the brain and in the brain cells that result in the symptoms that are associated with concussion that leads to the diagnosis. If you don't have those symptoms, you can't be diagnosed with a concussion at this point, but that may still be doing something to those brain cells, whether temporarily or with enough of them, one after another after another, it may lead to long-term consequences. And then it's possible that somebody who never had a concussion but just played one season because of the number of sub-concussive hits could actually uh, have significant changes to their brain, I guess, huh? I, you know, one season of play, I, I'm not that concerned about. I, I, we don't know, though. We just don't know. But uh, the, the combination of the duration that someone plays, the number of hits they get while they're playing, based perhaps on the position that they play, the age that they started, all those things come together. And we're trying to figure out exactly what that, that magic combination is that leads to later life problems. Or lastly, Dr. Stern, your group recently published a study concluding that participation in tackle football before age 12 greatly increases the risk of developing cognitive Is it me? Bad somewhere. Jones. <laughs> uh, we'll try again. Oh, all right. I mean, I get. Yeah. Is that one? Um, I guess so. All right. So, um, your group recently published a study concluding that participation in tackle football be before age 12 greatly increases the risk of developing cognitive issues later in life. And in a separate study, you also found that the more hits a player received, whether through youth, high school, or college, the more likely that player was to struggle with mood and behavioral impairments later in life. So, Dr. Sand, just tell, talk about how much of a concern these subconcussive hits are for, you know, particularly young football players before age 12 or or either of you, are the measures taken thus far? Um, well, let, I, let me just ask about the young people, because that's my particular concern. There are so many questions we don't have answers for at this point. You know, there's growing evidence. Time after time, papers are coming out suggesting that having your head hit over and over again as a child may have short-term and possibly long-term consequences. I guess the point I would make is that um, does it make sense to have our kids be exposed to those types of hits? Uh, I, I take off my science hat and put on my parent hat and say, you know, we parents do a lot of things to protect our children. We do everything we can to keep them healthy, to have them stay away from injury, to reach their full potential. And then we uh, let them off at a playing field at age six, seven, eight put on a big helmet with a face mask that makes them a bobblehead and say, go at it. Hit your head over and over and over again against your teammates, your opponents, the ground, at a time when we know the brain is going through this incredible development. Does that make sense if that brain is getting moved around, jolted around, that brain that really is the most precious organ in our body? Does it make sense as parents to do that? Regardless of what the current scientific knowledge is, 
does it make sense? The thing is, we are getting more science. We're getting more understanding that it does have an impact later on. All right, and then if I could issue, Dr. McGee, last thing. Are there measures taken thus far by the NFL enough to reduce the risk to professional athletes posed by these repetitive hits to the head? Well, so the issue is with the NFL, there's been such a focus on concussion and concussion awareness, and all, and all of those efforts are, you know, to be uh, uh, applauded. Uh, but the real issue with NFL and college-level football and youth football is the routine hits that occur on every play of the game to nearly every player on the field. And that's what, you know, that we can't, we haven't seen much change in uh, in terms of the NFL. We need to really think about uh, keeping contact fully out of practice. We need to reduce head hits by stylistic and behavioral changes to the game. We actually need to start thinking about some very uh, 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 severe changes to the game so that the players wouldn't be having collisions and tackles on every play of the game. That's the issue in football. Uh, Collisions, tackles, and subconcussive hits are an intrinsic part of the sport. Uh, In another sport, it's a more random effect, but in uh, football, just like in boxing, it's intrinsic. And that is what the NFL has not dealt with to date. Thank you. Chairman Conyers. Thank you very much, Chairman Pillow. This is, I want to get to uh, a part of this and involve uh, former linebacker DeAndre Levy uh, and get some of uh, you players, uh, ex-players, into this. Um, you stated uh, in a uh, Detroit Free Press letter that you believed that football players are, quote, almost numb to the risk of CTE because it's part of the job. I think we as players have to acknowledge it and talk about it in a real way and demand answers. Would you comment, please? Uh, Yeah. Um, What led me to saying that was um, a conversation I had in the locker room with eight or nine guys. Um, We, you know, the locker room is a loose environment. We joke a lot. So, you know, we joke about memories or, or issues we have with our memory, like our partners at home telling us something three, four times, like we all chime in and we relate to that, you know? And uh, not one of the players knew about the links, that, uh, about any of the research that we're finding out that this could very well be something more than just forgetfulness, you know? And um, I put a couple guys to the side and we talk about some of the emotional issues we have, some of the mood swings, some of the highs and lows that we just come and go. And I think a lot of times, um, we use football kind of as the guard and, you know, maybe say, okay, this is just a part of the season. This is just a part of something that's – it's just normal. You know, we think it's normal because that's just – I don't know. That's just how we operate. Football is kind of a different culture. But uh, I, I, it bothered me that not one player knew anything about the CTE research. I mean, we see the headlines, but unless we're cued in and paying attention to it, I don't think a lot of guys will, will uh, you know, be able to – link them. For a long time, I was unable to link it. You know, I had memory issues. I had times during the day, during the week where my mood just switches, and I don't know why. And I can't control it. I can't come out of a funk. It's like a fog over me. And a lot of guys, I think, have the same issue, but they don't know how to link it. And, you know, we don't talk about emotional issues, uh, uh, you know, for the most part in the locker room. A guy isn't going to come in and tell you that he's feeling depressed or he's feeling anxious or he's feeling sad and he doesn't know why. Um, and do, do you the, think that... Uh, Players are aware of the risk uh, associated with playing football? I think we're aware that we'll have bad shoulders, we'll have bad backs, we'll have bad knees. I think a lot of us kind of know that that's par for the course. I think speaking for myself and just conversations I've had with guys that have played professionally, high school, collegiate, I think for the longest, um, a concussion to us was just a headache. It was a headache that if you can play through, you're good. Once it's gone, it's gone, you know? Um, And I think a lot of guys still have that mentality and still think about it. And I think there's a good portion of guys that don't want to think about it because, honestly, it's frightening, you know, to consider that, you know, when 10, 5, 10 years down the line when you're done playing that you could be a completely different person, you could slowly decline or 
you know, rapidly decline. I think uh, when you're going out there, pursuing your dream, trying to provide from your family, try to create some financial freedom for your family, um, you don't want to go out there and be scared or timid and think about the long-term effects. I think a lot of guys will intentionally put it out. Does anything occur to any of you about what needs to be done to raise the awareness of this issue? Um, um, I think that uh, every parent should be fully informed with all of the information that has been disseminated through Boston University or other sources. They should be uh, informed as to what risks they are subjecting their kids to. Any football player that you ask, or anyone who has played football, because I'm, I'm sort of a little different. I, I played football, but I was never really a football player. And so I've always sort of looked at my life as something, you know, football is something very, very temporary. And um, the, the issues that are there uh, are, are issues that um, start when you're young, parents should understand that uh, there's, a, there's a physical risk that you assume. I think all of us understood the physical risks. But when we played, myself, Mike, Eleanor's husband, when we played, there was no information on the neurological risk. Mm -hmm. And so that information is out there now to understand that if you sustain an injury to the brain, you may never, ever be the same. As players, we knew that we could possibly, down the road after playing, have to have knee replacement surgery, a hip replacement, or shoulder replacement surgery. But when you injure the brain, you can't replace the brain. And so you're dealing with um, issues of the brain, and the brain is really the most complicated organ in the body. And you don't know what's going to happen, uh, you know, once you are removed from, from playing the game. And you are so far removed from whether it's Pop Warner, whether it's high school, whether it's college or even the NFL, once you are removed from the game, who do you complain to? There's nobody that you can complain to because your career is over and, you know, I, I personally have had the opportunity to... Um, uh, come in contact with young people who are in their teens who are having neurological issues. Young people who played high school ball and now they're in their 20s and they're having neurological issues. Individuals who never even got to the NFL who are having neurological issues, having played the game. So the issue, while we focus on the NFL, is more widespread than anyone really knows. And I, I think that, uh, again, every parent should uh, know exactly what they're signing their kids up for. Um, <coughs> last year, uh, and I've been a very vocal advocate for um, former players who have sustained traumatic brain injury and concussions and so forth, but last year I petitioned the Surgeon General and the Center for Disease Control to um, do the same thing with football and contact sports as they've done with cigarettes. And that is put a warning on the consent form so that they'll know exactly what they're signing their kids up for. So... What might it say? Uh, uh, understand that your child or the participant uh, could be subject to some kind of neurological injury that might affect them for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask my final uh, question. Uh, what advice would any of you on this distinguished panel give to parents who may not be here today or may not be getting in on this hearing? I'd like to start by answering your first question, um, actually, which was, 
what do, we, what do we need to do to raise awareness of this? And I think one of the more interesting things that I've experienced doing this now for 14 years has been the fight against this information. When we had our first hearing in 2009. To keep it from coming forward for, for us getting into it in the first place. Yeah. Yes. I mean, in 2009, it was interesting when we had the original hearings on this issue, um, how much the NFL fought this information and their history really? that, w that was laid out very clearly at that hearing of trying to dismiss and minimize the CT research. Now we're eight years later, hundreds of cases further into the research. And I was blown away by, you know, I, one of the only ways we've had to get the right information out to the public is through the media or through f forums like this. Families aren't getting it through football. I think what DeAndre said it shocks to me that we're so far into this and the players still don't know. Um, right? But also parents don't know. So I think, you know, in response, I mean, and I'm, I'm going to pick on somebody because they went on record on this. I was surprised in response to Dr. Stern's recent study on youth football, the way that Pop Warner fought this with dishonest statements, not with truth, not with we still don't know, but with actual factual dishonest statements. You know, for example, the, the executive director of Pop Warner in response to the last study went on uh, WBOR radio and said, well, this, it's important for parents to know this, this research was not peer reviewed. And it was peer reviewed, like that's not a debatable thing. And then the medical director of Pop Warner in response to Dr. McKee's research was uh, quoted saying, if I can find the right one, I don't think the real risk accrues until you play professionally. There have been very few that have been discovered at the college level only. And that was in response to a paper that Dr. McKee published saying 48 out of the first 53 college football players were positive for CTE. So my, my concern and what I fight every day is, you know, is still really an advocate at heart, although I finally wrapped up my PhD in May, is that we need to get, let people make the right choice for themselves. And I, I, it, it's, it's, to me, as a, as a guy who played football in college, I'm embarrassed that members of the football community are actually giving people misinformation as they're trying to make the ch best choice for their child. I, I, I actually now... Um, thank my mother frequently for making me wait until high school to play football. And she's probably watching right now, so hi, Mom, and thank you again. <laughs> um, and that's the advice that I would give to every parent right now, is that it's very clear from the research that there is danger each additional year you play. And I think, and I'd love to hear the thoughts of the other panelists who played more and much better football than I did, if there's any advantage to actually playing as a young person as a football player. And what I'm hearing in listening to whether it's Harry Carson who's gone on record many times or whether it's Mike Ditka or John Madden or Jim Harbaugh or um, Joe Namath or, or Brett Favre, all of these people, Hall of Famers saying do not, there's no advantage to playing football young. So do not play football young. If you want to play, and even if you think it's the greatest game in the world, wait till high school. And I think that's the best advice that we can give parents today. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, j yeah, just following up on that, um, I agree. Um, I think you can develop your child's skills without football. If, if you love football and you want him to play football, and you can develop their skills without putting on a helmet and shoulder pads. You know, you can play flag football, sign them up for soccer. You know, there's ways that you can develop them and get some of the great benefits of sport without, you know, the neurological damage. And um, there's – there's no benefit for it from putting on a, a helmet on a seven-year-old. Um, if, if they maintain that interest and they, that drive that it will take to even reap any benefits of football, they have to maintain that through, you know, taking it away at six. And when they are reintroduced maybe at high school, senior level, if they still have that interest, then, all right, we can maybe talk to them then. But the, the amount of work and hours and energy that it takes to get a scholarship, if that's like the first checkpoint in getting something from football and then playing professionally, I think the energy time and uh, just sheer, I guess, work ethic that it takes to get anything from it, you can put that somewhere else and, you know, it's not going to happen magically. So the energy and anything that you put into football, put it somewhere else and, you know, try to, try to go that path until you figure it out, until the NFL figures it out. Thank you all for your comments. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I... Oh. The hand went up. Talk to the players still, or? Yeah. Oh, you can say whatever you want. Sure, go ahead. That's why you're here. Um, 
make a long story short, uh, I have epilepsy. I was diagnosed with it for 19 years ago. And the reason why I had it diagnosed was I was on the air and I was just doing a normal sports cast tonight. The Bulls beat the Portland Trail Blazer 96-90. Michael Jordan had 26 points. The next thing I know, I felt like this wave coming over my body. And the next thing really? after that was I went in my room uh, and my shirt was dripping wet. I went to a neurologist, uh, the preeminent guy in Chicago at the time. He said he did all this checkup work and he said, you know, uh, you've got a, a, a big lesion on your left temporal hemisphere and my uh, opinion is that um, you've got that from playing football. This is before CTE. So I, I, my dad was an all-pro linebacker from the Browns, a doctor who played without a face mask and leather helmets. And, you know, I love the game ever since, um, you know, having, having what we, you know, players who played, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, you know, we, talk, we talked about uh, f getting knocked out in concussions as dingers. It was the red badge of courage, yada, yada, yada. I played on special teams. Coaches loved the fact that we w left over the pile of players that were trying to block us and then hit the receiver with our heads, and the guy would blow up. We'd slap each other the high five. Coaches would come over and hug you uh, for doing this great thing. So a lot of guys didn't know what the hell was going on. And it wasn't until yeah. two years ago that I went to the doctor again just to get a routine uh, check up on the epilepsy, and he said, yeah, we've, we think we have that under control, but we've also found out uh, just looking at some of these, uh, uh, whatever, you know, um, MRI, that uh, your, your epilepsy looks like it's, you know, going down, but we've also think that you have uh, a lot of symptoms that are current with CTE, and I jumped up and I said, hey, wait a minute. You know, we're not, you're not supposed to be able to find us until, you know, we're dead. So I don't want to die right now. I got a kid and families tell me what I can do. And they gave me a whole list of things and basically athletic and eating food and the right stuff. And if I have another bite of kale, I think I'll puke. <laughs> um, but, the, but the real thing here is I see I can feel the decline every single day practically. You're going around like this. And then the next thing you know, you drop down a little bit. You're not as sharp as you once were. And then you drop it down a little bit, and you start to get scared. And when you get scared, uh, a lot of things happen. And my wife, who knows all about this, she's got the credentials, and um, she sees, and th this is something that nobody's really talked about, is what happens to guys who played in, their, in the 80s and who were over in a 40 years old, whatever. Uh, their families have taken a huge hit because of their of de our husband or father that um, I don't think any of us knew was going to happen, but i just like her to talk for a couple of seconds because families are the ones who suffer the most from the CTE stuff. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you. I, I should say my wife always tries to feed me kale, too, and it really stinks. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I put it in a smoothie. He doesn't know the difference. Um, no, thank you for this opportunity. And, and I'd like to also state that uh, I would, if I may, speak for the thousands of families out there. I'm part of a group of women, NFL Wives. Uh, it's a Facebook group. There, there are uh, approximately uh, 2,500 of us in this group, and we're in the trenches. Uh, we're just beginning to learn about CTE, what it is, what does that mean, what are we supposed to do, but we're in the trenches. We've been living it, and our men, our husbands that we love, have been demonstrating these bizarre behaviors and symptoms for, you know, 12 to 15 years, and we haven't known what was going on. Um, many of us experienced a great deal of um, major catastrophe, chaos, and loss in our families. If you look at statistics, the divorce rate for NFL players is 75 percent. I think in the general public it's something like 51 percent. In our group we talk about it, and you'd be surprised at the number of us who divorced, and yes, Mike and I did divorce at one point when his symptoms became so severe and we didn't quite know what was going on, our lives were torn apart, but how many have divorced and now finding out what's actually going on have reunited. It's partly out of understanding what happened, 
and understanding that the love wasn't gone and this was out of our control, but it's also partly out of the fact that these men need us. They are not able to live on their own. And so we have had to become, in the trenches, in our family, day by day, we've had to become the primary breadwinner. We've had to take care of our men. Um, I, I can talk more about that in specifics because we're hearing the facts and what's going on in the brain, but how that translates to everyday life is um, um, pretty catastrophic, pretty traumatic. Um, we have, to, we have to handle all the medical affairs, all the scheduling of appointments. Their medical needs are huge. The, the, the med number of medications alone. And so you're handling not only the day-to-day -day of taking care of the man, but you're also managing the systems, the medical systems, the insurances, the disability, getting the pensions in place. Now we have a lawsuit. We have to know the law. The lawyers don't know what's going on with this case. And, and so the wives are doing their best to navigate the system, to network, to share what we know, because everybody wants a part of this. Out of the thousands of cases that have been filed in the settlement, the case action suit, approximately 100 have been um, paid out, often much less than the original amount that they were entitled to. Most of the money that's been paid out, $112.5 million, has been to the attorneys. They have their money. There's a lot more involved in that. But the women, the wives, are the ones trying to navigate that system, trying to address uh, all of the, um, the steps that need to be taken, all the documentation, hoop after hoop after hoop, uh, battling the attorneys, battling the NFL, where they may have a diagnosis, and now they've come back, they've got to get it over again, or they'll find li some little piece that it, to um, disqualify them. So... Um, the financial loss, many of the men, they lose their jobs, they lose their livelihood. 15 to 20 years of productivity. The effect on the family is not just financial. The children have to watch their father decline. They see their father in rage. They see their father become aggressive many times to, to the wife. They see their father unable to carry on a, a, a conversation. Um, they see them restless. Um, my girls, um, one, um, our one daughter, um, Mike and I adopted in 2004 at the age of 13 from an orphanage in Ukraine. Um, horrible, horrible circumstances that she came to be in the orphanage. She thought she was finally safe and in a family. A little over a year ago, she moved out and she told me, Mom, I cannot stand to watch another parent die. And she was gone for a year and didn't come back. She's now come back. She's handling it. Our youngest daughter has become um, more of a, a friend and a bit of a caregiver to her dad because Mike has difficulty with everyday living things. He's the, he's the most intelligent man that I know. And he just had recent testing again. His word knowledge is superior. He was, you know, on the air. He's, he's amazing. He's brilliant. He's, he's charismatic. He retains that. He had a huge cognitive reserve. His, his bank account of, of knowledge and, you know, expertise. But in the areas of everyday living, the executive functioning is huge. The executive functioning is just everything we do is a series of decisions and, and sequences and organization. Those are the very things that are gone. And Mike and his testing over and over is down in like the first percentile. There's none. Turning on the TV. Operating your phone. He loses everything. And Mike, I'm sorry, his zipper's always down. So... It, it's over and over. Oh, we're oh. going to draw the line. Sorry, honey. I'm sorry. This is, this is real stuff. But um, I could go on and on. The devastation is huge to the families. These children have been affected uh, where they go to college, if they can go to college, where they live. Many of us have lost our home, have had to downsize. And the wives are trying to hold it all together. So... Um, we need to be heard. We are coalescing. We are trying hard. We're pioneering what needs to be done. We're sharing what we can do. Mike and I, um, through the Concussion Legacy Foundation, we're honored to be um, um, 
the ambassadors of uh, the Mike Adamley Project, Rise Above. And it's where what we're doing is we are trying to give hope um, and inspiration to the families out there, as well as the affected players, of, of what you can do. Um, we don't have a cure, so how do you live with it? How do you live with it with dignity, with optimism, with energy and excitement, and with a sense of purpose and contribution? Well, we're so glad that you're here with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, thank you Chairman Connors. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, our Congresswoman Schakowsky. Oh, did, are you okay with that? Yeah, okay. I hope I don't. Can you, you can hear me? Okay. So, um, March 14th of 2016, I came to a roundtable um, and I had prepared questions from my staff. This was with the NFL and the Energy and Commerce Committee. And I asked the question first of Dr. McKee and then of Jeff Miller from the NFL, who's head of uh, health and uh, welfare of the, of the league. And um, I said, is there a connection between C CTE and football? And I guess for the first time, um, he said, oh, yes, of course. There is a, a connection. I had no idea what kind of explosion there was outside um, on this. And, and, and the other thing I didn't understand is the power of football. We're talking about a multi-million dollar or multi-billion dollar industry um, when it comes to um, college. Um, you know, th this is the way some schools survive through, uh, through the, the revenue of, of football. It's not just the money, though. It's the culture um, of, uh, of football, the Friday night lights in small towns around the, uh, around the country. Um, you know, we've, we still hear from the president about, you know, the good old days when there was violent, more violence in, in football. Um, and I, I, so I'm really new to this, uh, the, new to the game and proud to be part of the team, but John Conyers held a hearing in, in 2009, and research has been going on for uh, a, a long time, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful to all of you, to advocate, to researchers, and especially to the players and families who have such incredible courage, because I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you're kind of bucking this huge empire out there, which is, uh, which is football. Um, I, I do want to uh, make sure that, that we give an opportunity um, um, to Dr. I want to. I can't see it from here, but um, Dr. Perfetto, is it? Yeah, to 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 have your your words too. But here's what I I really want, and, and I really love the idea, Mr. Carson, about um, a, a uh, warning um, on you know the uh, allow it when you allow your your children to uh, to to play the game to understand what the consequences could could be. So first let me ask Dr. Perfetto to, I'm sure you came here with a message, but, but then finally I want to say, what has been your experience with football? Both, you know, and, and Mike, by the, oh, I just want to say too that I'm from uh, Chicago. I live in Evanston, uh, Mike. I remember well when you were at uh, Northwestern and, and with the Bears and on, and on television. Um, I just want you to know that in a survey of 87 schools in the, air, in the Chicago area, there are 2,549 less football players than there were in 2008 at the high school level, almost a 20% decline. The biggest year drop came in 2016, eight months after the movie Concussion came out. Whitney Young Magnet High School, you may know about Whitney Young, um, canceled the remainder of its football season this year because it didn't have enough, uh, uh, enough players. And, you know, you know, Mike Ditka would tell his kids, uh, you ought to think about golf. Um, and, and so, I, but I, I just wondered, what, what have you encountered bumping up against football um, 
in your struggle to get the, the, the word out. But, but first, Dr. Perfetto. Thank you very much. And I really want to thank uh, Member Connors for the, the hearing that we had in 2009, because in my view, it was a very pivotal point in changing the direction of this conversation, and it really made a difference. So thank you for that. Um, I uh, am in a different position than I was in in 2009. That time, my husband was still quite ill. He was in a long-term care facility being cared for, and my husband passed away in 2012. But we struggled with the disease for almost 20 years. At first, very much like the story that you heard, not having any idea what was going on. And then later, finally getting a diagnosis in 1999, he had to go into long-term care in 2007 because I could no longer care for him at home. And in 2012, my husband died. This is a man who spent most of his life, he was six foot two, uh, roughly 225 pounds for most of his life. He was, had been 250 to 275 when he was playing football. When my husband died, he weighed 145 pounds. His brain was half the size that it should have been for a man his size and age. His brain was functioning as Anne, Dr. Ann McKee estimates at the level of about a one and a half year old. For several years before his death, he could no longer stand or walk. He could no longer feed himself. He was being completely taken care of by the caregivers at the home and by myself. We fed him every bite of food that he ate for several years. So I think if to, to understand the progression over time and the magnitude of what happens to an individual, you know, if, you, if, if I had answered the question earlier about what should parents be doing about having their child play football, they absolutely should not be having their child play. Why don't you just push your child in front of a moving car? I mean, that's the impact that we're talking about here. So when you see the progression of the disease over time, when you see the devastating impact that it has on an individual, on the spouse, on the family, and when they get to be disabled on our Medicare system, because that's who's paying for a lot of this after when, when all of these testings and thing, things are being taken care of. And then uh, another part, uh, just to add to that, to the to the aspect of Medicare, um, once you um, get to that point where we are in this lawsuit against the NFL, um, you do manage. You get you do get a letter that says we've been notified that you're one of the the um, uh, the people who might be getting a settlement from the NFL. And oh, by the way, all that Medicare money that was paid, we'll be taking that all back. I believe rightly so because Medicare did pay for all of that. But it means that the families who need that money will get far, far less because insurance companies and the Medicare system will be taking all that money back. So the, 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 the spread, the magnitude, the ramifications, the ripple effect um, are so far, far bigger than people really understand and, and, and really um, can, can really conceptualize until they start to hear at a forum like this about the things that have happened and the things that are going on. So um, with that, I'll say that, that, that I think that this has made a difference. I believe the first hearing made a significant difference. I believe that forums like this can make a difference for getting that word out there. Um, and I, I think it, it really helps just to spread that word. Um, there's so much more that can be done so that players know, so that their wives know. But I've been saying for the last 15 years that I would be happy to talk to any wife. And at the time that my husband was still alive, I made the open offer. Any husband and wife who would like to come and see what's happening and really understand, I would be happy to introduce them to my husband at the time that he was alive. Not one single person ever took me up on that. But I had several former players say to me, I thought about it, I was just too scared. If you could answer, anybody could answer my question. I, I, you have a lawsuit, and I don't know what you can talk about there, but um, what has been the response that you've experienced uh, with foot, football? You, you mentioned a little bit, Dr. Nowinski, about how football is, uh, and, and Eve, all the way down to Pop Warner, has pushed back. But I'm just wondering if there's been any, um, you know, help and compensation and... <coughs> Um, one of the benefits that, that um, the NFL offers is uh, called Plan 88 um, from John, John Mackey, Mackey from from yeah, and whose number was 88, hence the name Plan 88. And basically that just uh, states that um, when an ex-player 
um, is given a, a, a diagnosis of dementia, then they uh, are entitled to, not entitled, you, you can apply for benefits. That's often been unwieldy, and the expression has been deny, 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 or deny, delay until they die. Um, many wives have had a great deal of difficulty um, um, obtaining that. Um, I think because of the nature of my background and understanding assessment and documentation and, and, and diagnosis, um, I was able to put together a portfolio of Mike's um, application, and we were able to, um, to obtain that. I know many families have tried for years and have not been able to obtain funds for that. The Plan 88 pays for any out-of-pocket expense related to medical expense related to their caregiving um, uh, for dementia. Um, so that's a nice benefit to have, but it's been difficult to obtain. In the, the actual settlement case, um, as you said, uh, yeah, the NFL is, is formidable and uh, uh, the, the wives are coming up against it. We have wives in the group who are attorneys helping to lead, and because we're having to also fight the attorneys. Um, the attorneys, uh, one of the, the latest things that has come out is that um, there's a 5% that is going to be put into the pot to pay for future attorneys' fees because they're anticipating many thousands more of players in the pipeline will be experiencing this. But what the attorneys are trying to do is take that 5% out of, once again, the players' uh, settlement, what to, what to do to them. So, uh, and many of the attorneys, um, I mentioned the, uh, the pot, Judge Brody put aside $112.5 million to pay for the attorneys' fees so that the players did not have to pay that, who are already stretched financially in their care. So um, the attorneys were paid out of that. However, many attorneys are also charging their clients upwards of 20, 25, 33 and a half percent um, on top of what they're also receiving. And when the, the players and their families protest that and ask about the double dipping or ask them to justify um, what they're charging, um, then the, they are now putting liens on the settlement amounts that the families are to receive. So many families are not receiving any money. And when they do receive it, it's got uh, it, it, um, one family in particular I think of, the husband has uh, ALS. And um, they were to receive, and he, he was diagnosed at quite a young age, I believe he's in his young 40s, they were to receive several million, I think it was uh, possibly four million. They received um, 1.2. So they were asking, you know, where did the other monies go to? Went to um, attorneys and, and their liens. Um, the uh, claims administrator uh, took out what he assumed was uh, given to Medicare, and this family had not used Medicare it was an assumption that was taken out, so they have to go through more paperwork proving that they didn't now in order to get that back. Um, so, uh, And then there's still, even after doing all that, there was still uh, 1.8 not accounted for. So they still don't know. That's just one example. I received emails when uh, the other wives found out that I was coming here. Other emails documenting many, much of the same. Another wife whose husband had a diagnosis they had um, they submitted their their registration, and now the NFL is coming back and saying, um, uh, questioning his diagnosis. They've submitted uh, so, so much. The, the, yes. Is that? I just want to add one thing, yeah, one thing onto that because um, there is this tremendous barrier. Um, so first, I think there are two, actually two things. One is that the the way that the settlement was laid out, what the families are going to get, um, had lots of caveats around it that that were very misunderstood and were very complicated to understand. And it really had to do with um, getting less money the older you were when you were diagnosed. Well, the problem with that is that the NFL uh, had hidden so much information for so many years that there were so many people who would have been diagnosed many years earlier at a younger age if the NFL had not been hiding that information. So, for example, I probably would have known 
uh, almost 10 years before my husband was diagnosed, uh, if, if the NFL had released information rather than covering it up. That, of course, means that these people are getting less money because of their age at diagnosis. So that was a big problem with the way it was being calculated. That has never been resolved. It's still that way. Plus, there are other things that take that deduction off. Um, but there's also these, these hurdles that are being put in place um, for it to be difficult to be able to collect. So here I am, somebody who has been literally on the front page of the New York Times with my husband on this issue, and my application has been rejected several times. If, if I could just add that there's one important caveat to what you're just hearing, that when they refer to being diagnosed, it's not being diagnosed with CTE. CTE is not covered at all by the settlement unless it was diagnosed after death a year and a half ago. No one else moving forward after death will get any payment for diagnosis of CTE, but no one diagnosed with CTE during life, whatever we come up with as a way to diagnose it, or if someone has severe dementia and there's no other reason for it, if they're told they have CTE, they don't get compensation. And if I could just add one quick point, you asked about the industry response. I mean, I think there was one big moment for me in terms of figuring out what the industry's response is going to be going forward, and that, and that was laid out very well in uh, Ranking Member Pallone's uh, Democratic Committee report last year in 2016 on the NFL's uh, not fulfilling their, their commitment to the NH Foundation for research on CTE. That, to me, was, was a, a, a line in the sand that said, let, let's picture what, what happened. This is Dr. Stern's study that is now being funded by NIH. It was supposed to come from NFL money. And the quick history of it is in 2012, the NFL was prove, it had been proven so many times to be funding the wrong things that were in their interest that they said, fine, we give up. We'll let NIH choose. When NIH chose what the best research is that will help these guys and help people like me and give us hope that there will be a treatment for CT, they refused to fund it. And they made up a whole bunch of really em embarrassing to those doctors who were involved, embarrassing reasons why they wouldn't fund it. So now we're $16 million short. The, the, the study was delayed. And now the NFL is, do is a do-over saying we're going to give $100 million, but none of it's going to go to CTE. So they're not funding the biggest problem facing this group of people while they're still putting money into recruiting children to the game through things like the Heads Up Football program, which the New York Times also showed that was falsely marketing to children. So that is, you talk about industry response, to say we're reliving big tobacco, again, um, is worth saying, because I feel like that's what we are seeing day to day. Thank you. I yield back. Excellent, Lee. Thank you very much. Um, let me um, thank all of you for being here. After the 2009 hearing that we had with Judiciary, we went to Houston, Texas. Uh, and had a hearing uh, to deal with this issue. Uh, and frankly, um, it saddens me that we are here in 2017 and listening some of the most provocative testimony. Uh, I'm going to take the time to um, acknowledge that we have had hearings in uh, Houston, in Washington, on the Judiciary Committee, and then uh, in New York uh, was a field hearing as well in 2010. Um, and there have been other hearings um, in Detroit, um, and I hope we will get back. But, I, but the, the real issue is uh, what are we going to do and what are we doing uh, now? And I'd like to um, put into um, what I know will be some form of a record uh, the New York Times, A Football Widow's Traumatic Journey, which is Dr. Perfecto and sympathy to you, and then um, to Mike's story, uh, Adam Lee, uh, to uh, have the Chicago Tribune say it all, your words were, it shook my world. Um, I'd like us to have that in the record. Brother Harry Carson as well, uh, when uh, to restate some of the points that were made, about 110 out of 111 brains were donated by deceased former players, showed signs of CTE. Uh, and then, of course, Dr. McKee, who has said there's no question that there's a problem in football, that people who play football are at risk of the disease. I also think it's important, although this is probably not fully extensive, uh, to put in the roll call, which is a tragic headline in and of itself, 
of the New York Times, the NFL's tragic CTA roll call, uh, which has uh, Mike Webster uh, Jr. Uh, show, uh, Ken Stabler, um, Dave Duranson, Frank Gifford, um, and a number of others uh, who are listed here. And I won't read the entire list, uh, but um, it is certainly uh, evidence that we have a long-standing problem. And to hear uh, the family's testimony uh, is uh, particularly challenging to me. So, so let me, if I could, um, focus on Mr. Cars, Mr. Levy, Mr. Adam Lee, uh, who I understand received another diagnosis, uh, and that is when you determined or was determined that you had um, CTE and while uh, you still lived. Um, the joy that um, has been noted already uh, that is given uh, to America because uh, you young men, um, as you were young, uh, took to the playing field for the love of gain, but also for um, certainly that was your work. And I think that's one of the things that we need to accept, that that is your work. Um, and you go to work every day and you put your very best in that work. Um, I, I will deviate just for a moment because I'm going to ask you about the owners um, because we have to come together. Uh, I believe there should be legislation that instructs and demands. Uh, and because the NFL is a, um, a corporate entity uh, with federal oversight, both in terms of taxation and also in the antitrust questions, we have a role in the United States Congress and we must demand a position uh, and demand uh, oversight and demand um, a response. Uh, we cannot do this any longer. Um, and so uh, with a little um, point that I, I, I just have to make, uh, the, the complete, um, um, how should I say it, hysteria uh, that is created by young men who have taken a knee, um, who still go out and play, who still love this country, who still reverently kneel uh, because there is um, a, a petitioning of grievances that they desire to do, that has uh, caught the minds and hearts of the hierarchy uh, of the NFL. And I don't know why this that impacts across the board, uh, <clears throat> young men in the prime of their life who love the game, have chosen this as a profession to provide for their families, uh, and uh, it is ongoing. Uh, it is stunning to me. So let me start with you, uh, Mr. Carson, and, and I want to take up uh, Dr. Stearns and, and Dr. McGee's, uh, I'm sorry, I know it's, uh, is that a K over there? I'm not looking, okay. K, Max McGee, thank you. Uh, challenge, uh, the NIH should certainly be doing major research in this, Centers for Disease Control, but I've just come from the NIH just a couple of weeks ago. They have an enormous capacity to do this research. Um, that's one component that I think I know that uh, my colleagues are probably looking at. Um, and, and then uh, the, the question of um, uh, where does this, wh where does the responsibility lie at the top? And you've mentioned uh, young people, but I'm going to get to the NFL and I'll come back to a question about early uh, age playing. But, but Mr. Carson, if I, if I can, um, as you were playing, or if this happened after the fact, is this on any agenda? for the NFL owners meetings and when it was at its peak, was there some uh, NFL uh, effort except for, and I know there have been, uh, I'm looking at a concussion policy, but, but going beyond that, rather than saying, oh, this is, you know, let's get these guys out of sight, out of mind, and let them go into the courts, is there any understanding that the core survival of this league I mean, it may look like there's a never-ending source of young men who want to play from all walks of life, all backgrounds. Is there any crisis understanding of where we are on this? Ms. Carson? Well, let's just understand that to an NFL owner, a player is a commodity. The average career of an NFL player, when I played, and this is back in the 70s and 80s, was about 3.6 years. Today, the average career is about 3.4 
years. So you have to draft every year, and players who are injured, lose a step or whatever, they are uh, discarded, and the NFL or teams move forward. So uh, the issue of concussions is, is one that I, I think nobody really wants to talk about it, but I've seen players who've sustained multiple concussions, and at the end of the year, you know, they're allowed to either go into free agency or not re-signed. DeAndre probably would, um, could speak a little bit more on that because he's more recently removed from, from the game. But uh, to the owners, you know, the players are just a commodity, and they really don't care, in my opinion, about the health and welfare of the player because once they're no longer a part of the team, you know, they've already moved on with fresh players. It's, it, to, to me, it's sort of like leasing a car. And um, you, you get to ride that car around, and after a couple of years, you know, the car might look good outside, but there's so much damage that has been done to the engine. Well, that's with the NFL player. There's so many players who still look good physically, you know, recently removed from the game, but uh, down the road, you know, they're just a hot mess because, you know, their brains have been jostled and bruised and so forth. And I've seen so many players, and I sit in a very unique position because when I came into the league, I saw the older players, and I saw how those older players who had, had left had deteriorated and uh, passed away as a result of of dementia and Alzheimer's and so forth. Uh, I was diagnosed in 1990 with post-concussion syndrome, so I've sort of been my own specimen for the last 27 years, just sort of listening to my own body. But uh, when I started talking about the whole issue of uh, concussions, you know, there are players who basically laughed because we all played through, you know, getting dinged. Uh, but I paid very close attention to uh, my diagnosis. Uh, the doctor who diagnosed me with post-concussion syndrome, at first I thought I was going to, you know, perhaps I had a brain tumor or something. And he said it was post-concussion syndrome. And I asked him, will I live? And he said, you'll live. You just have to learn how to manage it. So over the past 27 years, I've learned how to manage it. And I've uh, been very vocal about uh, this issue because there are so many players who are dealing with um, the issues of traumatic brain injury, and not just players in football, but players in other contact sports, along with uh, you know, servicemen who are in, in the military who are dealing with um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and, and post-concussion syndrome, and, and they're, they're dealing with um, head trauma, and they literally think that they're going crazy. And so, um, you know, that's why I've been an advocate uh, on behalf of uh, players who have played the game. If you ask me, um, given what I know now, would I do it all over again? I'd say, hell no. I would not do it over again because, you know, you only get one brain and you have to take care of that, that brain. And I basically am the dictator in my family because um, I have an uh, eight-year-old grandson who uh, turned eight yesterday. And I've already informed uh, members of my family that he will not play football. Mm. He'll play any other sport. He, he can play uh, tennis, golf, swim, baseball, but he's not playing a contact sport. And I've, you know, and, and he lives in South Carolina, and that's football country, South Carolina, the South, you know, the SEC conference and all of that. Um, so I, I've made that decision for, for my family. Given what I know now, I, I, would, not have, I, I would not have done what I, what I did. But, um, you know, I, I just have so much respect for um, the guys who have played the game. Um, the one thing I uh, never wanted to do is um, disregard those who have played the game and not acknowledge that, uh, you know, football players are very dignified, very strong men. And whenever uh, they lose 
their dignity as a result of playing the game. You know, it, it angers me. I'm not a part of the concussion lawsuit, and I did that by, by choice because I feel it's more important for me to continue to uh, share my story on uh, my, own, my own situation as opposed to people thinking, well, he, he's only saying that because he stands to benefit financially. I'm not looking to benefit financially, but I'm going to continue to say the things that need to be said. Uh, honestly, uh, speaking from my own experiences, I admire what uh, the folks here at Boston University have done in, in regards to collecting brains and research and everything. But I've lived my own life, and I've had the opportunity to come in contact with so many individuals who never even got to the NFL, but they're having so uh, many uh, problems from a neurological standpoint. And I try to be a, a beacon for them, someone who can uh, share with them so that they don't go the route of, of um, other former players like a Junior Seau and a Dave Durson. And I only wish that uh, those guys were my friends, and I only wish that I could have spoken with them to tell them that what they have, they can live with, and there was no need to commit suicide, but they did. And by committing suicide, they've put everybody uh, sort of on notice that there is something going on. And if you don't acknowledge that uh, there is something wrong with uh, players when they leave the game and, and they can no longer take care of themselves or they fall into a deep depression, uh, then those individuals who commit a suicide would have, uh, you, you could say they committed suicide in vain because they certainly um, shot themselves in their chest and not their, their head because they knew something was going on. Thank you. If I can um, thank you, Carson, uh, uh, passionate um, words that you've said are, are not going uh, unnoticed and, and they're not in vain. If I can go to Mr. Uh, Adam Lee um, and then Mr. Levy, and as I understand that you have said that you were diagnosed with epilepsy and then the CTE diagnosis came to your shock, so and your comments about uh, having this as a priority for the owners um, it, it, do you see it? Uh, should it be? And then, and I, Ms. Levy, I will be asking you, then we need to find a way to intervene on how the game is played uh, and the idea of tackles. But anyhow, your story about your sense of their sense of how crucial this is for those who played and those who are playing. Well, I would, I would just say that there's a lot of guys who are assistant coaches on different teams across the league who are former players, and they know what's going on with regards to that. I just don't think – the other night on Thursday Night Football, on the opening kickoff, a guy is laid out on the field with a concussion, and it just rang a bell. And going to, to what Harry was saying about the former players, and there's a lot of guys, that, the pre-59ers uh, – Guys who would like, God, everybody, you know, from, I don't know if, did anybody see Super Bowl 49 before the game was, they paraded out every single MVP. And the first guy came out and he was like this, uh, uh, Bart Starr was there, all these guys. It just, it, it just was so incredibly sad. And there's a lot of those people whose families are screwed up. I think, and I disagree with, if I had to do it all over again, and I think you'd get maybe about 95% of the players would say yes. And the reason why they would say yes, because of the wonderful friendship and com camaraderie that they did down the line. You look at, you know, Dave Durson from the 85 Bears. That whole team was the closest group of people I've ever seen and still see. And it, it's sad that, you know, what happened with Dave, it shouldn't have happened, but it doesn't happen with anything else. Uh, as far as the game being, it's going to be here for a long time. So what kind of things can you do to help it? Well, my dad, going back to being a doctor, he didn't let me play until I was in the 10th grade, until my, you know, I was fully prepared physically to go out there and do that kind of stuff. Um, 
So maybe we ought to think about that as a way, you know, Chris and I have talked about that. Uh, Learn how to play in space and move. This is a, a little off the tan. The old uh, Soviet Red Army hockey team, they won six consecutive Olympic Games. They finally were derailed in 1980. But they had a coach who traveled the countryside, and he went to different houses where there were young athletes ready to play hockey. They were like 13 and 14 and 12. And what he did, they did, they had a, a four-month camp, and they brought them all to some place outside of Moscow. And they the first, it was all about movement and freedom. And so the, f the first month, all they did was skate. No puck, no hockey stick, and they learned how to move in space. Two months later, they get back on the skates, this time with a puck on their hand, and then eventually the stick. So they, so they knew how to, how to move, they, and, and it makes all the difference in the world. If we're going to still can do, you know, do this, um, it's a little bit far-fetched, but Newt Rockney, when he had the, the uh, four horsemen, he had those kids play ballet <laughs> once, or do ballet like three times a week, just to learn how to move in space, and you can, now, you know, it's so... Uh, we, we, we've lost that capacity, I think, uh, that kids need to just know how to do that first. Um, if it's still going to be around, and I think it's still going to be around. But if we're a coach, um, uh, it, this is a good a guy. A guy named Rod Marinelli was the defensive coordinator for the Bears a couple of years ago. He's now with Dallas. And he said uh, in a preseason camp I was visiting and talked to him, and he said, Mike, you know what? I can't, I, we can't tackle again. We don't have enough time. We can't, it's a lost art form. And it truly is. You look at, when he played, Harry didn't lead with his head, and he grabbed him around the waist. You can watch old Dick Butkus films, and the same thing. This, everybody thinks he was this murderous guy who was a dirty player. Uh-uh. He knew how to play the game. And I think you would agree with this, Harry, that, that we need, because if, if it's not going away, let's, let's do the right things to, to make it still happen, if it's possible. It may, not be, it may not be able to happen, you know. I mean, mass times acceleration equals force. Masses are bigger. Accelerations are greater. So it's, it's going to happen, but... Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for that. Mr. Levy, um, it seems that there is um, the um, concern about training, turning style, changing style changing practice, but owners and what you have seen uh, in the course of uh, your playing. Do they understand the gravity of this, and does there need to be a federal intervention? Um, yeah, I don't think the owners are in touch with it. It's, it's a business. Um, we're a number. Our bodies and brains are disposable. Um, I don't know. I can't speak for every team. I've only been with one team, um, but I I mean, I've never sat down and talked with the owner, so there's no connection between the players because right now we're the only ones that will even care about the issue. Um, I don't think you can really change football by tackling a certain way because before me as a linebacker, before getting to a tackle, I'm getting into a collision with a 250-pound fullback that isn't even on. Nobody sees that. I have to do that routinely. Um, it's just inherently in a sport. I have to run into a 300-pound blocker, a lineman that's much bigger than me because I have to go make a tackle. So those are the hits that I take two or three hits before I even get to the tackle, which could be just a routine soft tackle that just doesn't even – it's not a collision. So you see guys get small collisions and they're on the, on the ground. You see guys in big collisions where you think for sure they're not going to get up and they get up. So it's the small routine part of it. I think we can – right now before – until we get enough research to learn more, I think we should try to mitigate and limit those risks. I mean, I don't know why we're still in, in practice even. You know, I'm in 20, 30 sub-concussive collisions in practice, whether it's going against my own teammates, going against our offense, uh, hitting a tackling dummy. You know, as a linebacker, I'm taught to hit with my head and my hands. It's just inherently a uh, violent sport. And just to survive and not get injured, you're going to open yourself to some of the risks. So I think right now we should – try to find ways to limit those risks and uh, cut down on the unnecessary collisions. I don't think we should be in any collisions other than on Sunday. There's no, makes no sense. I've went in the games on Sunday with my neck and my head 
aching just because of Wednesday and Thursday. And I think we can cut that down until we figure out a more substantial answer. I think right now, I just think of, you know, the players that don't know. Right now, they're going, they don't know. They don't know what's coming. So, um, yeah, we got to find a way to get the message into the locker room. And it's funny, um, I think uh, Chris spoke kind of more on a macro way the NFL's responded to CTE. But even in my experience, like the letter you brought up, the moment I said anything about it, I had two calls telling me that I should, shouldn't talk about it. And I don't know if it was because CTE or if it's because just the general NFL room, like only football, only talk about football, only think about football. So I posted simply the research. I spoke with Dr. Stern um, a couple summers ago, and I wrote the, wrote the paper, and I was told not to talk about it the first day I was out. And I'm just like, you know, it could have been just because, you know, locker room culture is nobody wants to talk about anything other than football. But it, it, it didn't sit well with me when I'm talking about a brain injury, you know, my brain. It's not my shoulder. It's my brain. It controls everything I do. It controls everything we think, we feel. And if I don't have the right to speak about that as a player, I think it really speaks about kind of the culture of the NFL, what the conversations are. I think that's indicative of the conversations that we don't hear, the closed door conversations between the owners. They still are trying to find ways to silence us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you're saying Congress should act, right? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Next is uh, Congressman Steve Cohen from Tennessee. Whatever, y'all can hear me. No. Uh, first, I want to thank Mr. Conyers for having set up the hearings that we had when the Democrats were in the majority. And I participated in those hearings. Yeah. They were good hearings. They've stopped because the Republicans are the majority. And like on most things, the Republicans care about management, and they care about wealthy white men. And they don't care about labor, and they don't care about humans. They don't care about health care. They don't care about injuries and workers' comp. And it's unfortunate. And that's why we're here now, because of Democrats who are here. What Mr. Carson said about a leased car, it, I could go further, but I'd say it's more like a sharecropper. And sure, y'all want to play and you get paid a lot, but you're all were being, and I love the game. Ollie Matson was my favorite from a thousand years ago. And, you know, but the, the owners are like up in the boxes. And the only injuries they're possibly being subjected to is cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> and they stay up there and watch the game and high five each other and make tons of money and I'll have tons of money because this is what they can do. They can buy teams and own players. And it's a lot like sharecropping or slavery. They are the owners, and they don't care what happens to you, and they use you for 3.2 years, and they go on. And it's like they won the game. It is just awful what's going on. The knee is the whole thing they're concerned about, and it's, it, they should be concerned about the players, brain injuries, concussions, and other situations. Let me ask you this. I think Dr. Uh, McKee might have asked, asked a question about, is the NFL doing enough? They're, they're not. But what else should they be doing? Well, they are funding research, but the research that they're funding is research to minimize the effect of CTE, to deflect the attention on CTE, and uh, to obscure facts that we've established. I have a $6 million grant that I got from the original NFL money that was given to NIH. We've done an absolutely amazing job over the last four years. Most of the brain donors that have come in came in from that funding, and we've published, I, I, I've lost count of how many papers. In that circumstance, to be that successful with a the grant, there would be a renewal. But there's absolutely zero chance of any renewal for that grant because all of my research has implicated this as being an even larger problem for the NFL. And, and that's important. It's extremely important. Your work with Dr. Stearns, and it shows the problem. I understand that. But what I'm thinking about now is what are they doing on the field as far as the, 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 the play and trying to see the not spearing and, and head tackling and all that. Are there, are there penalties or the, the, the repercussions? Yeah. Just, Levy. Mr. Levy, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's n nothing other than fines and penalties. Um, you can find guys, and I think now they're trying to suspend guys for certain certain type of blows, but 
I mean, that's that's just teaching players to aim lower. Um, my helmet hits your knee; it's still my brain being moved in my in my skull. I think, um, yeah, that's that's all the really extent of it. it's not talked about. Which is funny because in the NFL, it's always kind of a every few years it's like a hot topic. Uh, a couple years ago, it was um, like the last few years it's been like domestic violence, where in training camp we come and get a big presentation and we talk about that. A few years before that, it was. Uh, when Michael Sam came out, it was talking about a gay player. So we, now we had to sit down and talk about equality and treating people equally and watching our language. Then it was gun control a little bit before that, and it was domestic violence. And every year, whenever the hot topic comes, they have to address it. I'm sure this year they're going to be talking about players protesting. Um, but through all of that, there's never been anything talking about, a, you know, CTE. How about we had our hearings in the past. There was a helmet company came, and they had all kind of – Opportunities to, to, to have that's, they can prove the hel helmets. I think I think that's just trying to capitalize on a hot topic. Football is a big, it's huge. It's a twelve billion dollar industry. So somebody's trying to the hot topic is CTE. Okay, we have a solution. But I joke. I don't know how accurate it is. But it, to me, putting money into a helmet is like when we were in junior high, trying to think of a great package. You know, you try to think of a way to wrap an egg so you can throw it and it doesn't fall or crack. Like you put a lot of money into it, you create this nice package, but if you shake that egg around, whether it cracks or not, the brain is still, the yolk in there is still sloshing around. Like, I feel like that's kind of what our, our brain is in this fluid. Like, you're shaking this egg around, and it's, the brain is sloshing. The egg isn't cracking. You put the be most beautiful package on, you can drop it from the roof, it won't crack, but that brain is still moving, tapping, tapping around in there. So, if I put on a $2,000 helmet and I run into somebody 40, you know, whatever the forces are, I don't know if we have any physicists in here, phys whatever, but. Let, let, let's just assume for the what Mike's saying is true, that we're going to have football. We should have better helmets that protect you. Do they have the best helmet possible right now? Oh. Well, short, short of getting a NASCAR helmet that looks like the size of an astronaut in space, and now if you look at the helmets, they actually look, look that big. Everybody's walking around like this because these things are so heavy. And I, it, it, it goes back to, you know, mass times accelerate. It's a physics equation. I don't know if that ever can uh, – here's what happens to a lot of guys – um, a good friend of mine played for the Bears recently, got up in years, was a linebacker, and when he was younger, he was able to, you know, get down and make the, pro the proper tackle. All of a sudden, he's a little up in years, he's lost a step. So now, the only way I'm going to get to this guy is it's like a, a guided missile. He launches himself off the ground, and he, there's, nothing, there's no such thing as a complete wrap-up anymore. And you see that way too often. I don't know how you legislate that. You can do it a couple of times a game. But it, they could do it almost every single time, for that matter. Here's the thing about concussions. It's, people have known this for a long, long, long time. There was a guy, uh, Steve Reed. Uh, it was, he was our, my the team doctor for Northwestern, and he did this longitudinal study that started in 1964, landed to about 1968, and he had a, uh, one of the, at least one guy in the game, a defensive player and an offensive player, two guys, they had this pack on the back of their helmets, and it had this needle that went up and down, and after this, you know, it was able to just see what the force was, not whether or not it was a concussion thing or anything like that. But it's, he said it basically was get, a guy getting hit is like being hit by a, you know, a 747. <laughs> just, just the impact of, of the game we play. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure that equipment can, can make a difference. May I, may I just make a statement? Um, <clears throat> again, I've been sort of – I was trained to be an educator. I really wasn't trained to be a football player, but it was just something that I – fell into. And just the educator side of me, I took enough science, and I wish I was a scientist like you guys down here. Um, the brain is inside of the skull. The helmet is outside of the skull. The helmet does not protect the brain. It protects the skull. There's absolutely no way that you can protect the brain when you know, you're running at a high rate of speed or you get hit or whatever, the brain is going to go and hit against the inside of the skull. And if I'm not mistaken, the, the skull is a, it's a bony area inside of the skull. Is that correct? So you, you're going to have uh, tears on the brain when you have a violent collision. And oftentimes, there are many times when 
You know, it's not a big collision. It's just incidental contact. You know, whether it's somebody's knee hits you, hit, hits you in the head and you're not really prepared for it. So, you know, I've had helmet companies approach me to be on their board and try to convince me that they're trying to make safer helmets. It really doesn't matter because the helmet protects the skull. It doesn't protect the brain. I'm going to finish up because I know there's Jerry, Jerry McNerney needs to go and I, I need to leave, but he's... Kent Hull uh, died of a liver condition. Uh, one of his family members is a friend of mine, good friend, and that family member told me that that condition was caused by all the drugs he was given starting at Mississippi State and going through the Buffalo Bills to keep him where he was able to play each and every game, keep him going. How much of a problem is that in the NFL, of players being drugged up so that they don't feel the pain and they go out there and they play, and effects that that has on players as well? No, quite frankly, I, I can't comment on that because I played so long ago, it was a different era. Yeah, and, and there was, no, 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 there was a lot of, there was a lot of drugs back in the uh, 70s and 80s, and there were a lot of guys who were being shot up to play in games. It wasn't, you know, it was like Novocaine or Cortisone or something like that. So I, I am really far removed from the game. Perhaps he can share. He's more recent. He's, he's the baby of the group here, <laughs> and, and he can share his thoughts. Modern times. Yeah, uh, I think... Um, They've gotten a little better with it the last few years. My first few years in the league, I could get Vicodin like Skittles. Like, you can get Toradol shots like it was nothing. Naproxen, any anti-inflammatory or painkiller to get you through the week. Um, and as a player, I mean, it's on the doctor's hands to give you the, to, to control it, I think, and monitor, especially when you consider some of the psychological effects a player may have. Maybe him going in there four times a day and getting two Vicodin each time isn't a good thing to do. I mean, and again, it goes back to education. Like, we don't talk about the, the effects of any of the drugs we're getting. It's, you know, it's a 16-week season. People are trying to make it through. Doctor says, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> I, think, I think it affected, I think it killed Kent. Yeah. And yeah. It, it went on forever. You mentioned Skittles, and I think that's, you know, the Trump used Skittles and said, you know, you, one poisonous one, you wouldn't eat the package. And so if there's one Muslim that comes in the country, you know, you wouldn't want it, so you don't have any of them. So in the Skittles defense, 10% on the NFL ought to be enough. If your Skittles had 10% that were defective, you wouldn't eat the Skittles. But they don't want to think about it, but it's good with Muslims. Yeah. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Congressman McNearney. Well, I, I want to thank uh, Frank and uh, John for having the hearing today. And thank the, everyone here in front of us. And I want to thank people that are listening to this, too, because... The more the word gets out, I think the better off we're going to be. I heard a couple of things that I just want to sort of rehash. Uh, Dr. McKee, uh, you mentioned that uh, at a minimum 10% of the NFL players are, are going to be affected or are affected by CTE, and that this is uh, the question you asked, is this an acceptable risk? I think that's a pretty profound question at this point. Uh, and, and then, Dr. Stern, um, your question was, uh, do we want to have children engage in sports, or we want to have children, it's not a question, we want to have children engage in sports, but how do we do it without risk to CTE and related problems? So um, in the prior uh, set of questions, the, uh, the technology came up, you know, can we make a helmet that's going to save people's brains? And, and, the, and the thing is that uh, these deceleration injuries are, are what's causing it. Is there any sort of technology, Dr. McKee, you could see that would make a difference? No, it's not. Uh, it, this, the solution to this is not going to be technology. Uh, as, as Henry Carson said, the, the skull is essentially nature's helmet. These are forces, acceleration, deceleration, rotational forces. The brain expands, elongates during the course of this collision, uh, and, it, and it actually breaks the individual nerve cells uh, because of the stretching and, and twisting of the brain inside with these whiplash-type injuries. It, so a helmet's never going to prevent that, and it's the constant nature of these whiplash or acceleration deceleration injuries that's why football is dangerous that's why there's this risk and that's what really needs to be addressed if we want to make this a safe sport i don't think the sport will be safe and still look like the game we play now well it seems to me like the nfl is a pretty tough nut to crack 
<laughs> but when you're talking about children and, and, and parents, then we have an opportunity there. So it might be a good idea to put together some sort of program to develop new rules for junior football and then maybe another set of rules if applicable for high school football. And then I think those rules will over time migrate to the NFL. So what would be the best way? Would it be a forming commission? How would we decide what rules uh, should apply to junior football? Yeah, as a scientist, I don't do rules. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, echoing what Dr. McKee said, a helmet's not the answer. And there's been a lot of um, discussion, a lot of messaging, let's put research into it, let's build the better helmet to prevent concussions. And there's been all this messaging from the NFL down about concussions. Think about how that is what permeates our discussion all the time is concussion this, concussion that. It is so important that so much has been done to prevent concussions, to manage concussions appropriately. But when we're talking about CTE and these long-term complications, it's not those symptomatic concussions. It's not the big hits. It's not the spearing. It's this repetitive hit, that part of the game that is just part of the game. So when it comes to changing rules, policies, I think it has to start with appropriate messaging, that those changes should not necessarily be just to reduce concussions, to manage concussions, but to take the head out of the game, to protect our brains as much as possible so we don't have these long-term problems. We have to focus on those sub-concussive routine hits and not keep talking about concussion. Right. If I, 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 I get that. Um, uh, Kim? Yes, um, I, I was just thinking, you know, if, if we're not going to be able to change the NFL and we can't make the players safe, um, and we've been talking about children, um, it seems to me if we go to the source, if we go to the families, the source will eventually dry up or the NFL will change because it's being forced to. So how do we reach the parents? Um, I've been a school psychologist for, for decades. It seems to me that our public education system might be one institution in place that we might be able to make some inroads. Um, I know that I spent, um, my, my doctoral studies were in working collaboratively with families um, and, and parents. So how do we work with them? I don't think it's merely giving them facts um, the, the, um, uh, Mr. Cohen spoke to the culture and coming from the South. You're not going to change people's minds that quickly just by stating statistics. But by working with parents, making it first mandatory that if your child is going to play, you need to come to these series of, of uh, webinars where we present it and we, pres and we start that dialogue with parents and start to um, help them to understand and make more informed decisions about what is going on, should their child play, all the factors around that. Um, so I think that's one thing that you could start to do uh, where we have something in place already. You could start with school psychologists doing it who have knowledge of cognitive assessment, learning, the impact on these various things and learning. You can involve the, um, the uh, school social workers. Um, and I think you also need to reach, speaking to the culture, uh, we've talked about the coaches. The coaches have a certain mindset. Uh, in this culture, and I think we need to work with them specifically, giving them a great deal more education on this, and again, working within a process to change that mindset. If I can give a, a quick answer. I mean, the simple answer is we need to stop hitting kids in the head. You know, I mean, if we just say it that simply and stop hitting them in the head on purpose, which is where, somehow where we ended up with sports. And so just to give the fast answer, you know, all these sports that kids play were invented for adults college athletes around that age. We moved them down to kids to get them better, to recruit them, to create businesses, whatever it is, and we want them exercising, but we didn't always change the rules to respect what it's like to be a child. Sports are now, some of the sports are changing now. For example, we were very excited that we pressured U.S. soccer to ban heading up until, it should probably be 14, but it's up until 11 right now, right? The idea of throwing a projectile at a child's head and asking them to use their head to hit it back uh, is ridiculous. And so uh, USA Hockey raised the age of checking now to 13. U.S. Lacrosse has made all head contact a penalty. Uh, football is now on an island where they're the only one saying, 
hey, it, it's still a good idea to hit this five-year-old in the head 300 times. And I think we can all be confident there's probably never a good enough reason to hit a child in the head 500 times. And it's not something that any of us do to ourselves, ever. I mean, I would bet no one in this room has been hit in the head in the last month. You know, and, and guys are actually walking away from millions of dollars not to take this risk. So I think we just need to focus on this culture of we, we just got to stop hitting kids in the head in sports and let's change the rules of the sports. Well, I mean, what I'm understanding is that it's not just hitting in the head. If you hit somebody with your shoulder, your head is going to accelerate and decelerate as well. So who would be the best qualified to decide what, what's allowed? Well, I, I, I youth, youth. Yeah. Let's just stick to youth football. In old youth football, who would be the best qualified to make that? And I, and I think the answer is it has the the industry has proven that they are not the right people, no, right? Really not. I mean, I, and, I, and I, I'll pull another quote out that 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 the C, executive director of Pop Warner said. He said, if we converted the flag, which is what we promote, just play flag seven on seven, any other version of it, he said we would lose ninety to ninety five percent of our players because parents would put them to another league. And so just to realize the problem we have, we have this shell game of um, nobody owns youth football. And so everybody in youth football, even though we all know it's a bad idea, is scared to say we're going to have an age minimum because Pop Warner's going to lose their people to American youth football. They're going to lose their people to this league or that league. So it's got to come from outside football. That's the answer. And it's not, it, NFL's proven they're not the right people to do this. So I think it, the government has a role protecting our kids. And I think our government, and you need to figure out through which you want to do it. You know, the CDC, public health experts, I don't care. But it needs to come from without football if we want to push a solution forward. Hey, um, one final question, uh, Mr. Carson and Mr. Levy. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your observations with former players? I mean, are former players, by and large, all experiencing these kinds of problems? Or... Um, just the one, I, I, what's your experience in terms of other players? Uh, again, let me just share with you. I was diagnosed uh, in 1990 with post-concussion syndrome. That was probably the best thing for me to, to have done because I had so many things going on and I really didn't know exactly what it was. You know, sensitivity to bright lights and loud noise and so forth. Um, and so many other things. And so I had a name to go with what I was dealing with, and I've been able to live with it over the years. When I first started talking about it, there were players who literally laughed because during that era of football, we were all sort of trained to go out and play, and if you got dinged and you got concussed, you know, you may have walked to the other team's uh, huddle, and you got to laugh out of it. And, uh, but, you know, we all knew that, you know, you, you, you're going to get dinged just playing the game. So then there became players who would call me and they would say, Harry, I'm having some problems. I know that y y you've been very out front about talking about this issue, but let me tell you what I'm going through. And so it, it takes a lot for a football player to open up to another guy about issues that are going on with him. And so I tried to point him in the right direction. And then more and more players started dealing with issues. Um, not only were the players dealing with issues and were coming to me, there were the wives of the players who would ask if I could point their husbands in, in the right direction. So, you know, there are so many. And I know this is not just a a coincidence, there are so many former players who are dealing with neurological issues now that, you know, I call them uh, undiagnosed brain injury survivors. I'm a, I, I am a diagnosed brain injury survivor because I knew what I was dealing with and I've been able to live with it. But for all of those other guys, they're undiagnosed. And they're just sort of wandering, you know, they've lost their jobs, they're dealing with all of these issues. And, you know, Mike and his family, his, his, his wife, that's a clear example of what many of these, these guys are going through now with their spouses. So you, more needs to be done. More needs to be, uh, more resources should be available to families of men who have played the game 
Um, they're, they're, you know, they did a very good job of explaining what the issues are, but it's, it's well beyond what you see on the surface. And as I said earlier, it's not just an NFL problem. There are so many individuals who never even got to the NFL who are dealing with you know, these issues, and they're reaching out for help. Actually, in the interest of time, I think I, I'll yield to Mr. Cicilline, so I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, both Chairman Conyers and uh, Chairman Pallone for uh, convening this uh, forum and uh, thank the witnesses um, for being here and, and being courageous enough to share your stories, to uh, engage in groundbreaking and important research, and of course, important advocacy. And uh, your presence here today is already improving the situation by continuing to raise the profile of this really important issue. Uh, sadly, as I listen to the testimony of, of all the witnesses, it, I, I think the approach that we're seeing to brain injury and concussions and subconcussive uh, injuries is a symbol of a kind of a larger problem in our healthcare system where we talk a lot about physical injuries to knees and shoulders and uh, backs, but we our healthcare system doesn't reflect the same focus always or understanding of injuries to the brain. And I think we're seeing that play out here in the same way we do in our general healthcare and, and well being and prevention healthcare system. Um, I also, you know, I'm listening uh, be carefully because I, I played Pop Warner and played high school football as a fullback, got hit in the head a lot. Didn't play high school, I didn't play college football, but, you know, at the time that I played, these issues were not discussed by anybody. I mean, my parents are alive and love me, and I, I'm sure would be horrified if they were watching this hearing to know the kind of danger they exposed me to in, in playing in those games. So I guess my first question is, uh, there's a great uh, piece written by the chairs of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Federal Trade Commission entitled Helmets Protect Heads, Not Brains, to Mr. Carson's point. So I think the kind of question I have is, are there efforts that can be undertaken in youth, whether it's Pop Warner or high school football, that will make play in, in those forums safe for young developing brains or not? I mean, are there protocols that can be put in place? Are there new coaching techniques? Are there new tackling techniques? Or is the danger so great because of the age of those participants that it can't be done safely? I, I guess that's my first question. I'd ask both the players and the scientists and anyone else who wants to weigh in on that. If I could start, I don't think we know that there is a safe time. Just because some of the research looks at age 12 or age 14 or age 11, um, there is ne not necessarily a safe time for the head to be hit and the brain to be moved around the way you've described over and over and over and over again. It's just not made to do that. So putting it off is fantastic. Putting off exposure to any of those hits through youth football I think, needs to be done. But when is it a safe time? We don't have that answer. So to do what can be done to at least reduce the overall exposure to these hits by having no contact practices, by doing something to the change of the way the game is played on the field during games, to do whatever can be done to reduce the overall number of hits, I think is critical. But there's no safe time necessarily to start or number of years to play. I think another way to look at that is there's no evidence that any tackling technique is going to make any major difference. And even if there was, if, you're, if your best solution to preventing a child from getting a brain injury was to ask a 10-year-old to execute perfect technique every time, you're destined to fail. So I, I, we, uh, I've thought about this for a long time. The only solution is to, you can't ask children to tackle each other to the ground because their heads are going to get hit, especially when their head is much, much larger in, 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 with respect to their body. So they can't keep their head out of a collision. But I would also say, in terms of helping us find long-term solutions, as a former football player yourself, when I meet them and they say they've played, I have to ask as part of my job, are you interested, uh, Congressman Cicilline, in pledging your brain to Dr. McKee's brain bank? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great, great. I have a card here for you. If 
that I will share with you afterwards. Call me a football, yeah, after I'm dead, as Jan mentioned. <laughs> yes. Not today. But yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, Mr. Carson? Or you can become a dictator, as I have, and not allow your child or your grandchild to play. Uh, again, the information that's out there that they've largely um, developed and the life that I've lived and what I've seen, I'm sort of like Oprah. What I know, I know for pretty damn sure. And I'm not willing to assume that risk with my eight-year-old grandson. I'm just not. And so, you know, there is no perfect tackle. If you put your kid out there, bad things can happen. And I'm not willing to allow my eight-year-old grandson, who is so precious to me, to be injured in any way. I mean, if he scrapes his knee or something like that, you know, that's fine. But the brain, that's an altogether different matter. My, oh, sorry. Comment on that. Uh, on a, uh, 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 look at it in a little bit more depth. When we're talking about brain development, and the doctors have mentioned that there's no safe time or age that we know of. We can't pinpoint that. But I would also mention that there are critical periods of development that would be hindered. Um, and when we, we can talk about something like impulsivity or attention. So this isn't just that the brain is being damaged at this point and potentially will lead to um, what we're seeing with the, the older players. These are uh, for the younger brain and the damage that they, um, that they have. It will affect their ability to learn in school. It will affect their ability to uh, self-regulate, manage their own behavior, their affective um, behavior uh, regulation um, could be impaired. And when you think about what does that mean, that means um, uh, less ability to control themselves and perhaps getting in trouble with, with the law, making bad decisions as far as recklessness, um, not furthering their education. Um, so it has far rippling effects to society and what we see, and especially for our young men. So there's a, a huge rippling effect to the damage that can occur um, to a, a young Thank girl. you. And my very last question is for Mr. Levy and Mr. Carson. Do you see... He so said, what's your general impression about the, if there is any changing culture within professional football? Are coaches and professional staff more conscious of these issues? Are, are people starting to have conversations about changing the way practice is conducted, and, and et cetera? I mean, do you have a sense that, that they're hearing about these, the implications of this, even if they're reluctant to um, make big changes? No. None. <laughs> I mean, in my experience, no. Um, I, I, they made rules that, you know, we don't wear, have two a days anymore, but we still have our helmets on. We're still hitting dummies. Um, I don't hear it talked about at all. I don't think the organization wants to put that in a player's head that they can give themselves a degenerative brain disease. Um, you don't want your players out there Sunday worrying about, you know, damaging their brain. That's I mean, it's not talked about. Not, um, I think it needs to be in the locker room. There's like a little poster on the wall that has concussion really big on it and tells you how to properly tackle so you don't get a concussion. But there's nothing in there about the long-term effects of it, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's not talked about at all. Like, I, I think you, I spoke about it a little earlier, having a conversation with a handful of teammates, and we talked and shared stories and had similar issues. And, you know, at various levels, I was the older one, but, I, you know, we all had the same issues. And... Not, none of them could connect it to – they knew nothing about the research. They didn't know about the NFL's role in it. They didn't know about, like, anything. It was just concussion, 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 because that's the buzzword for the NFL to try to distract players from the bigger and deeper issue. Um, Bill Belichick was one of my coaches um, when I was with the Giants. And we've remained friends over the years, and when – the last collective bargaining agreement was agreed to. Uh, he sent me a text, and he said, Harry, the way they have rules are now, he said, you could still play. Because in terms of practice, there's very little contact. And so the NFL has done a lot to look into making the game safer. But there's no way that they can make the game safer because football is what it is. It is a, a contact sport. 
uh, people are flying around um, at great speeds and they hit one another. And, you know, so many players now who um, are, are not even being um, concussed in practice, now they're being concussed in games. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it to them. They're at least taking or making the effort to try to make the game safer. But by nature of the game, it, you, you just can't make it in any, any safer than it is. Thank you very much. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Look, I want to thank um, all of you. This was really an amazing uh, morning, and I think we learned so much, and we really appreciate uh, not only the experts, but all the the players and their families who, um, you know, really gave us insight into what's going on. And, and you know, we, we had this forum because we really wanted to get to the bottom of certain things, and I don't even, th I certainly think we should have more. Uh, but I really appreciate um, everything that all of you have said. Now, I just say, if there's anyone who feels that they would like to add something now, you know, regardless of any, I don't think we have any more questions, uh, please feel free. Otherwise, we're going to conclude the forum. Does anyone want to add anything that you felt you haven't had a chance? Harry? Well, I'm going to ask you as a congressman from New Jersey to um, do what you can with your colleagues to um, institute a system for parents to understand exactly what their kids are doing and what they're signing their kids up for. And we call it informed consent. So inform the parents, and if they want to consent to allowing their kids to play, then God bless them. But, you know, there are so many parents now who are not willing to assume that, that risk, and they didn't know the information that is out there now, so, um, you know, before. So, uh, again, if you go to the Surgeon General or the Center for Disease Control, uh, I, I think that would help people to make a more definitive decision as to what, whether they're going to allow their child to play or not. I appreciate that. You know, we... We, um, from when I was uh, started here, I had some mentors like Senator Lautenberg and my predecessor in Congress, uh, Jim Howard, and they would always say that the, what you're really about as a member of Congress is trying to uh, implement the right to know. I can, I can hear Senator Lautenberg saying it right now, that most of what we do, particularly in our committee, if I could say in our Energy and Commerce Committee, is about the right to know. And I think that's really what you're saying. Um, so I will definitely follow up on that and, and uh, you know, see, you know, whether it's through legislation or through, uh, you know, more outreach or whatever, a combination. And so I appreciate that, and I'll, I'll take your words. Uh, anyone else? It, yes. It's so Dr. important Stern. that we do focus on protecting our future players and doing whatever we can. But I want to raise to the committee's attention that this may be a growing problem over the next couple decades, just based on the people who have already played, and not necessarily those who played in the NFL and the pros. But there are approximately 12 million Americans who played just high school football, a smaller faction who played college football, who are now in their late 50s, early 60s, who started to play at the beginning of the era of the big helmets, the face masks, and then the beginning of organized youth football. The big helmets, face masks, they didn't start until the late 50s. Youth organized football like Pop Warner didn't start until the late 60s or 70s. The disease that we look at, CTE, is one of those diseases that gets worse with age. It's a degenerative brain disease. And so these folks who are now in their late 50s, 60s, and now we're going to have millions of them over the next couple decades, they're the ones who we may be seeing in my research when they're alive, hopefully to be able to figure out how to diagnose them. Sadly, in Dr. McKee's research after they pass, we need to do something now to help with that potential epidemic over these next couple decades. And that means increasing research funding so we can as quickly
quickly as we can, learn to diagnose it, learn to treat it, learn to perhaps slow it down enough so we can prevent the symptoms altogether. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes, go ahead, doctor. One short comment. Uh, building off of what, what Harry said, we talked about, you know, I guess, well, I guess I want to say this. We've been pretty harsh on football today. I want to recognize and thank the people within the game who have been trying to fight that fight. So we talk about limits in, in the NFL. That was really pushed through the Players Association. They had to fight for that. I want to recognize the Ivy League for getting rid of hitting during the season, my former football coach, Tim Murphy. This is an interesting thing where we now face it's really the football players and coaches often versus the football as an industry. And it's amazing to see these, young, these gentlemen come together as football players looking out for one another. And it'll take a lot more of that if we want to actually have a chance to fight this thing within our lifetimes because it is truly a life and death issue. So this is also a call to action to the former football players. This is a burden that we carry. This is a burden that we have more than just about anybody else. And we struggle to even find some of those powerful voices within football or any active players to fight this fight, and we need that if we want a shot. Thank you. I'm going to uh, turn to you, uh, Chairman Conyers, to conclude. Well, I just want to thank everybody for everything that's been said. <clears throat> this has been an important day in the subject matter, and I think it's going to uh, spur a lot of us in and out of the Congress to do a lot more. And I'm grateful to all eight of you who've uh, participated so fully. And I'm pretty proud of the, the members, our colleagues up here, who did a great job uh, in helping put this thing together, don't you think? Yes. Now, <clears throat> is there a possibility I could yield just briefly to Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And for anyone who saw me pop in and out, uh, let me indicate constituents uh, are always around That's and you water. must as well uh, oh. respond to them. Uh, those who were able to sit in the room behind you and listen uh, were just uh, moved uh, by the importance of this uh, hearing. And I, too, want to thank Chairman Pallone and Chairman Conyers and all of the members. And so I just, if someone can give me, I, I, I like to leave with a pointed issue uh, or issues just uh, focused uh, on um, that who we'll have to reach out to. Uh, so um, I, I, let me just get these quick points of which I will, they're not questions that require any long answer, but I just want to know the Players Association do we have them, because I know, uh, Chris, that you're working, do we have them understanding how serious this is? And I, um, I would say I believe so, right. yes. So we know that that's an ally that we can work with and, and know that uh, these young men are not sharecroppers. They shouldn't be treated as such. They shouldn't be treated as commodities, which Mr. Carson said. They are professionals who are working. You notice I mentioned the idea of the knee because I believe that all Americans have a right to petition their government to uh, um, our spouses, we call our wives, our professionals. Um, what do we need to say to the owners to strike their conscience? Um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Adam Lee, because I think there's an EDD behind you there. Or EDS. EDS. Is there one, sen one sentence uh, that you want to give? I, you know, What's striking to me, um, I didn't play football, obviously, um, but being around it, being with Mike uh, for as long as we've been together, um, and it's been his whole life. So, so um, I hear the players talk, and I see how they interact. I see these bonds of <coughs> friendship, of brotherhood, true brotherhood. They share this love that transcends time. And, um, and when Mike says that he'd play again, or other players have said that, it's because of that. It's, it's not because of the thrill of the hit, or it's not because of how many touchdowns they got. It's not because of how much money they made. He never made more than 40,000, you know, in playing the game. It's, it's those bonds, it's the brotherhood. And so what was, what's striking to me is that um, um, that kind of love and that kind of commitment to the sport and to one another um, and that the the owners 
don't share in that, don't honor that. And it just seems to me to be the right thing to do with the, um, uh, an entity like the NFL, um, who's practically another country, um, in terms of money that they make, that they're not reaching out to help their brothers. It's just the right thing to do. But instead, they're, they're throwing up obstacles. So. Thank you. Did you want to say something? Ms. The, the only thing that I would add to that is, <clears throat> pardon me, Maybe we should get to the owners' wives instead of the owners, because if they understood what the families were going through, um, it could probably help benefit the cause. So in closing, and I, as again, I thank the uh, uh, two, I, I feel a sense of urgency to act, um, and the two doctors who have offered, Dr. McKee, Dr. Stern, um, I don't want you to be shy. Is there a space and a role for the United States Congress? to help not only these men, um, but to help this ongoing um, uh, farm, <laughs> or production line, rather, of young men, no matter how much you tell families don't play football, uh, as Mr. Carson has, has uh, gotten his family to understand, is there a role, a, a direct and proficient role? We obviously have to be able to discern how that is activated on, but uh, I think there is a role. Do you think there is a role for, for this? I think there is a role. I, I don't understand, and maybe it's because I'm naive, why there isn't an occupational safety issue that we raise with the NFL. If this is such an occupational hazard, why are we allowing it? Or why don't they have to be more responsible for the, for the negative outcomes? To me, uh, their entire industry has been built on the abilities and the athleticism of these individuals. They have a uh, an ethical obligation to continue to make sure that they remain healthy for the rest of their life, particularly if the injury was sustained during the play of football. Thank you. And I would just add another role is in terms of funding for research, that um, right now <laughs> research in chronic traumatic encephalopathy is not considered a disorder related to Alzheimer's disease under the funding increase for Alzheimer's disease. There are several other neurodegenerative diseases that are part of that, um, that grouping of Alzheimer's and related disorders. This is very similar to Alzheimer's disease, and as Dr. McKee so beautifully stated, the more we can learn about this disease, the more we can help our understanding and, and future treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We need funding for CTE as if it's one of the siblings of Alzheimer's disease so we can get to answers as quickly as possible so those scientific findings can help lead to better decision making. I am most grateful and I hope Mr. Plone will see a role for the Judiciary Committee as well because I see some other elements uh, that we'll review um, in the role that Mr. Uh, Conyers has in his leadership on this issue. So well, thank you very much. Let me assure you, it's not that we don't feel we have a role. The problem is the majority, the Republican <laughs> majority, doesn't necessarily see a role, but we have to try to convince them. I did want to say that um, my uh, staff just uh, reminded me that uh, the Players Association did want to send somebody today. They, they have been supportive, but I guess for timing purposes or whatever, they, they weren't able to send anybody, but it wasn't because they didn't want to. So look again, thank you all so much uh, for, the op you know, for being here today, and um, we do intend to follow through. That's, we understand that. Thank you so much.